Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing. The three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 98. And we've got the returning Steve Brogan, one of our first ever, I think it was uh, episode <coughs> six or something, Baywatch Brogan. And he's, uh, he's, he's definitely the paddock's favourite, TSB. TSB? My thieving scouse bastard. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, the first ac- a- episode we actually started. Do you know what? The, 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 the amount of the amount of people that actually fully believed that story because it got like a good few minutes in. For people that haven't listened, like the uh, Steve started the first ever, first podcast by talking about getting into race and pretending that he used to steal bikes. Pretend and then pretend, Chrissy. And that's how and chasing getting chases off the police and that's how he got into racing. Obviously, it was just a joke, but it was like a full. Like, I, I, I think you you sold a few <coughs> people down the river there. Did I? I don't know if I mentioned this on the last pod. Um, I actually said that when I was doing a, uh, it was like a, a motivational speech, but it was um, to a big haulage company at Silverstone, and, and there was about six hundred people in the room, and that was me start me start online because I just thought they're all just going to think, well, how have we got a scouser here? And because uh, obviously, as you can imagine, over the years, the amount of shit I've had, uh, you know, watch your watch your watches, guys. It's broke. You watch your wheels. That's the first thing I get. So I'm used to it. So. I hit a nerve there straight off the bat. There. But do you know, it's, it's, all right, it's all right, mate. The three, well used to it. The three of us are sat here, all pu- chest pumped up and like out of breath a little bit. What are you on about? What are you on about? <laughs> just had us doing a the hun- joined the hundred club, so a little uh, hundred. Uh, what was a chest press on the uh, bench press? Bench press, and oh. uh, it, was, it was timed. It so was featherweight, take... just featherweight. And, uh, no, I t- I've got no, to say, no, no, Brogy no. absolutely smashed us both, well, annihilated all... us. Well, he set the bar, didn't he? He set the competition. It was barely five minutes of walking through the door. Like, do you want to do this and like oh wait it's obviously going to be good at it but I'll tell you what we're going to name drop you had Neil Hodgson do the challenge as well the flop man was it Neil Hodgson yeah it was Neil Hodgson yeah. there you go so how did he fare compared to us because we oh, were he, useless he was <laughs> he was um, not as good as I expected that's why I sort of um, said let's have a go get on here do um, <clears throat> do a hundred as fast as you can now you can have a breather whenever you want and uh, yeah I t- I tell it you, wasn't as good as what I thought it was going to be. Well, we, slot man. We saw him on the telly last night. Now, obviously, we're, we're going back in time here now because <clears> this is going to be released later on. But we watched the MotoGP last night. And on the telly, my God, he's looking thin mind, isn't he? He's never been a big lad, any stretch of your imagination. But he's there. Uh, uh, you don't want to tell him that. He'll be deflated if you tell him that. He's looking thin. Uh, he looks uh, lean. He looks healthy. Yeah, he real, is. Real he's, uh, through this lo- recent lockdown, he's been doing loads of walking. Um, where he lives is just in the middle of nowhere so he just gets off and goes walking to get out the house and break the day up so but his he's like Neil is <clears throat> he's like obsessive with anything he does and I know he was like this with his training when he was racing back in the day but uh, so he'll go walking and he won't just do like an hour walk and that'll be your exercise for the day he'll do like a 20 mile walk in a day and but he'll have his ear pods in and do all phone calls and i know he's been listening to a few audio books and stuff like that so. I'm, I'm big into them at the moment <clears> like because you just don't get the time to read do you sit down and read where if you like say if you're walking or driving you can like i, th- I, I went down to culture to kazaki like maybe a month ago or so and um i did John, johnny ray's book there mm. and back it's like 30, 11 hours his book but it just kept his company all the way and then just, and you know smashed it out in like two days Chrissy do you know on Audible right so I've only listened to one book on Audible what and book you could, uh, it was um, uh, what was it called uh, you put me on the spot a memorable one then. <laughs> no no, no <laughs> is it no. an autobiography uh, no no it was a, it's like it was a, it was a mind, mind management it was called The Chimp Paradox Chimp Paradox mm-hmm. any good really good yeah, like right. I, I don't read many books but I got recommended to read this one and tells you a little bit about how you obviously your inner chimp works and all the rest of it so I love that book and I think <clears throat> for, for bike racing as well I think yeah it's brilliant and in scenarios when you really need to control yourself but anyway sorry my question was going to be you said you just listened to Johnny Ray's in, in such a short space of time do you turn the, 
the speed up so they're like <laughs> <laughs> and your mind on the chimp comes down and no it's because yeah. um, <laughs> I tried to are someone, you trying to turn it scout someone said to me <laughs> somebody said oh yeah you can just turn the speed of the, the talking up and, and listen to it faster so it turns it off and like, you can and the like, on and your head's going like chimps and pansies <laughs> yeah you can do like 1.5 <clears> but <throat> I tell you do you know one thing that I, I've just done Shaky's book and one thing that I really, any good I, yeah really good <laughs> one thing that I really appreciated about uh, Shaky's book was Shaky actually narrates it so when he's talking about all the stories and the experiences and, and stuff it, you're listening to him talk about it himself right where like say Johnny's book I think he does a, a little brief bit in the beginning but then there's somebody else t- talking through it oh, which okay. sort of I, I don't know some people might prefer that but I, I I did prefer actually listening to Shaky talk about it I thought it was really good and oh, okay. uh, it's well, well worth listening to um, now <clears throat> there will be some people that are li- it's funny because when we first started the podcast um, there's people that li- still listen to every podcast every day so if you go through the, the stats and stuff so people will be listening to the podcast we did la- like two years ago now yeah. but they'll Obviously, our audience has massively grown, so there's lots of people that will be listening and watching this that maybe aren't familiar with you. So we're not going to we're not going to repeat the podcast, but do you want to just give a quick overview of um, your race, like your racing career, and what what you like the main parts of you what you achieved? Uh, yeah, so um, my my race career was spread over twenty years, uh, predominantly in British Superstock Thousand Championship. Um, and the reason for me staying in the Superstock Thousand Championship so much um, was because I had a couple of opportunities to go into BSB, which I did. Uh, not for the top teams, the likes of your GSEs or uh, HM Plants, although I'd done a couple of one off rides for HM Plants, only when riders were injured. But I always rode for lower tier teams, sort of privateer teams, if you like. and. I always preferred to run at the front in Superstock, you know, racing each weekend, knowing you've got a chance of winning or getting on the podium at least, as opposed to riding for a privateer team in BSB and you're battling for the top 15 or to get in the top 15 will be a good weekend on on them bikes and and with the team with that infrastructure and budget and stuff like that. So... um, yeah, that was so mainly Super Stock Thousands. I've done a bit of Super Sport, a little bit in BSB, as I said, um, starting in the early days, Super Teens and a Pretty Challenge, a uh, bit of club racing, obviously, at Aintree just down the road here. And the, um, that Evo class, where you, <coughs> that, that was part of it. it well, the rules that we've got now in BSB, that was kind of a t- 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 yeah, it, 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 yeah, it so we, tried it out. Yeah, we were like the test goat, if you like, for, for the um, electronics that BSB used today. The Evo Championship was literally, uh, essentially all the privateers, teams, uh, given the MoTeC ECUs and, and the the electronics that are allowed today. We were the test goats then, but when... So we were racing against all the other lads who had the Magneti Morelli and all the Pectel and all the other top electronics with all the bells and whistles on them. We had nothing, basically. Mm. Um, so... Stuart used us to sort of, which was brilliant. So we didn't complain because it was like it was a championship within a championship, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was brilliant. I enjoyed it. Um, it was the first year of the BMW S thousand, so I don't think BMW UK were too best pleased though because they'd spent years developing this BMW S thousands with all these bells and whistles, electronics on, and the first thing we had to do was rip it all off and put this basic standard. Motec ECU on with that had no uh, traction control, no nothing. Looking back, there was <coughs> there was actually some really good teams in that Evo Championships. Can you remember WFR? There was the that Split was Lath. Sat, that was Lowe's and Gowland and all that. That's it, it, yeah, and Westy and uh, Split Lath. A pretty yeah. uh, K- Tim. Tim had a team in um, <coughs> the K- with the KTM at one point, I believe. Tim Walker, yeah, yeah, Redline KTM. The, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what uh, there was. Obviously, the yourself on the on the Gen- BMW. BMW. Whatever yeah. happened with the WFR team? Not, well, I, I I believe that their background was cars, uh, so they were big car into car racing, and they had massive uh, um, units somewhere near Silverstone. Uh, so I, I think that's true. Anyway, they they employed loads of staff. They had two big Arctic trucks and 
um, loads of staff and it's big, one of them teams big that budgets. Sort of appear in BSB <clears throat> would do re- really successful. They had three bikes at yeah. one point. Obviously, Alex, that was Alex Lowe's first real step in super bikes, and like where he impressed because even in the Evo class, he was still in the overall <laughs> championship. He was getting front rows and things. Mm-hmm. And um, but then was, was there not a story where did they not try and sign Alex up on a long term management deal? And yeah. he then went to Nick Morgan. Yeah, and, I think that's what obviously they could see Alex's potential. Mm. And they tried to tie him into a long-term contract and uh, I don't know who Alex was being advised by at the time. Uh, they advised him against it, which obviously was the best thing that he could have done. Um, so he didn't sign. But anyway, but for some reason, what I, I don't know whether they went into liquidation or something like That's that. That's what I heard, yeah. And they, uh, they, yeah, that was it. The team was dissolved, but and it was a big team, big effort. Speaking <clears> of you... you- your career highlights obviously there was a, there was a few championships along the way do you want to just reel off your, the championships you won uh, yeah probably I mean uh, the starting from a younger days super teens was one two fives and it sounds like nothing when you sat here but when you're 17 years old that's British super teen championship all of Prilly one two fives was like one of the main championships as a kid you know to win and as you had uh, Chris Burns and Eddie was one of the top riders that I was against and he, I think he won it in 96 mm. uh, I won it the year after him 97 then uh, 99 I won the National 600 Championship which was effectively like the T-Cup race of the British Super Sport Championship so there was that many riders um, uh, apply, you know in got an entry for the British Super Sports there was like 40 riders that didn't qualify. So obviously I, when wow. I first stepped up onto a Supersport bike, I could never qualify into the main 40 British Supersport race. So it was called the shootout, the 600 uh, Supersport shootout, which was like a national championship. Um, so anyway, I ended up winning that at the end of the year. So it was like the best of the best of the rest, if you like. Um, then obviously moving mm-hmm. forward, uh, it was obviously the Superstock Thousand Championship was the main one that I tried to win for so many years and uh, for a few, I come really close on a number of occasions and uh, had the rug pulled from under my feet, should I say. Um, but anyway, eventually got to win it in 2008. Uh, I rode the 600 in, in British Supersport the same year as I, I was riding a Superstock bike and then obviously it's two years later, sorry. Was that the same year as you won the stock? You were also racing this super sport as well. Yeah, and do you I think... don't think I ever told you this, Chrissy. <laughs> no, we did. Come <laughs> on, you know what I'm going to say because yeah. I used to say it to you all the time. Every time, every time, time we used to go to Thruxton. <laughs> uh, Steve won the <clears throat> super stock and the super sport race in the same day at BSB. I didn't actually realise it was the year you won the championship that you did both. So did did you? You must have thought that was an advantage than getting extra track time. Yeah, definitely because obviously super stock a thousand, as you know, we don't really get a great deal of track time so i just thought perfect two bikes double track time yeah okay you're riding a totally different bike uh but unfortunately for me that year i struggled with the electronics on the super sports bike on the 600 and um it was the throttle connection right from the very first test every time i cracked the throttle it came in with such a bang um there was a big flame down out, out the back of the exhaust and the back wheel kicked from underneath me all the unburned fuel in the exhaust and i never forget ron aslam coming up to me because obviously i was teammates with leon that year and ron used to go out uh spotting leon <clears throat> and uh ron was giving me some advice and he said bloody hell steve um be a bit less aggressive on the throttle on the 600 when it's on its side over such and such a corner at cartagena he said it's coming in with such a bang like you're getting on the gas really hard it's gonna have you off and i said no that's me just cracking the throttle gentle it's coming in with a bang anyway that was at the start of the year and i complained to the team about this throttle connection issue with the 600 and they never got it better for me all year and and i can sit here now away from here and hold my hands on my heart saying i'd give everything i could on that 600 but i was always like uh, top five was was sort of the area where I floated about on that. I won one race on it, which was the uh, Thruxton one, which highlights the um, the issue we were having. As you know, Thruxton, you're rolling on to every corner, so it's not like re- any real stop-go corners, is there, at Thruxton, you're rolling on. So obviously that throttle connection issue that I had was really ironed out because I was rolling on to each corner fast. 
And uh, but I used to jump on the super stock bike and, and be on lap record pace, jump back on my six hundred and I couldn't you know, I was struggling to get in the top five. I had, exa- I had exactly <coughs> the same issue with the uh, a few years ago on the it was like a new model of a Kawasaki a few years ago on the first it was it ended up being the first few rounds were just cut <coughs> off exactly the same issue where on the edge of the tyre you would do you know when you just want that neutral oh, you're throttle? talking about recently on the Morello yeah. bike this on the and, ZX10, yeah. and you kind of uh, you're right lent over and you just try to get that neutral throttle and once you've got that you can then build up nice and gently yep. there, there was no neutral throttle so it's nothing 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 and then it would come in yeah, and so what it meant is you had to you had to get the bike turned and start like f- getting it facing the right way and pick it up yeah. and then get on and it, it it was a real it was really difficult to solve but as soon as we mm-hmm. did it was you you seen it <coughs> in my results straight away yeah and um so it was going back it was frustrating for me as you can imagine i trained as hard as I, I you know i'd ever trained and for this one opportunity it was like the opportunity of a lifetime to ride for the official hm plant on the team and be given two bikes to ride so you can imagine me walking into the garage at two 600s one side two fire blades the other side and all these stuff but i wanted to do just as good on the 600 as what i was doing on the stock thousand but i was getting the feeling of disappointment every time I come back in the garage on the 600 and I only had to look at the mechanics faces and I was told years later after that they, they knew what the problem was with it I can't remember what it was they said something but it was something mechanically in to do with valves or something like ah. that the reason why it was coming in with such a bang I wouldn't have thought that if it, I thought it would have been a fueling issue or something but I complained about it all year and it never ever got any better and then ultimately the the biggest sort of dagger in the half of me after that was that I thought I'd done enough to get myself a, a, a proper See. super bike ride with the HM plan team or and uh, I thought I'd done enough and um, Tuck said to me at the end of the day no sorry Steve um, we don't want you getting on a super bike because they obviously give it to Josh Brooks which that year 2009 was when Josh um didn't have the best of starts, let's say, with his uh, visa issues and then obviously the Mall- Mallory Park incident. And um, But I was after that seat that year badly and I, I was pleading with Tux to give it to me. And he was like, well, Steve, we don't want to, you know, after the your results on the 600 with the electronics, we don't want you to have the same problems on the super bike. And I was devastated because I was like breaking lap records the same days on the Superstock 1000 bike. Um, <clears throat> won a load of races, won the championship, but the six hundred. Uh, that uh, they say that that was what held me back from jumping on the super bike, and then obviously I, I, I watched it? I've watched Josh over the years from then from two thousand and nine to go on to see what he's done, and I just thought, if only if only I was given that one opportunity on that decent bike with the good team and and who knows but anyway looking back uh, i'm not uh, i've got no regrets whatsoever of my race career i got further than i ever thought i was going to do um back from all them days when i was stealing bikes on the fields and stuff (laughs) (laughs) i'm joking i'll tell you what you've missed a very (coughs) crucial point for me um you're a roads man as well yeah you've dabbled in road racing a little bit a little bit and we first just wash that off you know this tarmac hair gel wanker no one cares about that let's talk about the roads my man (laughs) yeah i know dom as you're saying briefly before we got started that i Take my hat off to all you lads that commit to doing the roads and the TT. It's just, um, in terms of bravery, sacrifice, everything, just to put it all on the line. To you know, whether you finish last of the TT or you're winning, you, I take my hat off to you because um, it's the for me my personal choice not to do the TT and to step back from doing the roads was is all the elements out of my control. Yes, I, I, yeah. example the. Uh, mechanicals and uh, you know your bike throws a rod oil all over your back tyre game over good night rogue seagull coming across you exactly you know animals running out on the track and for my personal experience I had again HM Plant Honda team was doing the Northwest 200 in 2008 Superstock 1000 bike done the first lap of the race come back onto the coast roads hit the brakes into the um, one of the last chicanes on the coast road and the back wheel locked up Naturally, I grabbed the clutch and I was like, oh, what's going on? I thought the bike had a gearbox was locked up. 
and uh, went straight up a little slip road, and the, the bike was fine. And I was like, weird. Anyway, went to go forward, let the clutch out, it wouldn't move, back wheel was jammed on. What had happened? And again, found out a couple of years later, um, Honda machined their own um, rear sets in Louth, and apparently the bit where the rear brake pedal goes down and pushes the piston up into the master cylinder was a couple of thou out and so it was pushing the piston in into the master cylinder so the bike back brake was binding now this is when we had there was the old station corner i don't know station corner still the same yeah Yeah, station but mathers is not the same is it mathers cross the old Mathers Cross was flat out in like fifth gear, Aye. but they put a chicane there now. Am I right in saying shame, that? Because yeah. I remember doing with like uh, <clears throat> my newcomers bus, and you think yeah. we used to do this, and everyone on the bus is going, yeah. "Oh, how are you, man? Can we not do that?" <laughs> Mathers Cross was like, <laughs> like literally, you just dab a little bit of brake, and if you depends on your gear, and if it was really tall, t- obviously you have really tall gear anyway, you might have to come back again. But it was flat out, and I just thought. I was sat on the Super Sport grid for the next race, and I just thought, if that happened to me at Station or Mathers Cross, I wouldn't be sat here. Good no, night. you wouldn't know. So I said to my mate on the grid that day, I said, this is the last road race I'm ever doing, because I feel lucky to be sat here now. And uh, yeah, and as I say, I found out a year or two later down the line, it was because of the back brake. But like no one on the day, like it was my life on the, on the line there that day. And everyone's all walking around scratching their heads and oh, the team happened, all, I? what's happening and, and, you know, the team manager. And I'm not going to name names and all the rest of it, but, it, you know, things happen. But no one was holding their hands up and say, sorry, or no one said, sorry, Steve, like, this is what's happened. Let me explain to you just to get your head straight. And I needed that for me to continue. I needed to be told what had happened, but no yep. one would tell me the true what had happened to that back break or how it had become... You know, lock up on me after because that's in your head riding a bike, isn't it? If you knew (coughs) why what's happened, you think that's the problem fixed, and you put things immediately to bed at that situation. Exactly Exactly. the same as crash crashes in that respect, where if you know why you've crashed, you can just park it and think, "Well, I did this, I made that mistake, and therefore I won't do it again." But if it goes without, I've had a few crashes in the past (coughs) where you've. yeah, I think, well, I did that the same. I've looked at the data yeah. and, the, and you, it's it's a, such a horrible feeling because then you've got to go back out and you don't you lose that sort of faith, don't but you? But even if that was like oil or something, like, you know, if it just snaps away from you, you think, yeah. well, well, how did that happen? And it's like, oh, it's oil. Yeah. Exactly, you think, well, that was oil. But to ride like that, I totally understand your situation, 100% understand mm. it. If you think, well, yeah, where, where's the trust? Where's the respect gone? And that's what I yeah, want to know. I, it's I, like, well, now nah, screw you, lads. You I know. felt a little bit... Um, you know, I, as I was saying earlier to you, Dom, you know, I was at the Northwest 200, best team in the pad, official Honda team, all the big flash trucks, best bikes, mechanics, all the rest of it. You think to yourself, you I'm almost felt like invincible, like nothing can go wrong. It's all, it's all down to you now. You know, they've got you here. And again, I was riding super sport, super stock, but I refused to ride the super bike. Again, just my <clears throat> uh, inexperience, let's say, on the roads. I wasn't confident enough. And they were having big engine problems in BSB with them. Uh, the engines were shitting themselves left, right and centre. So I opted not to, to run the superbike in uh, at the north northwest. But yeah. Yep. On the flip side, uh, the first time I ever went to the Northwest 200, I was 18 years old. I borrowed a transit van, a box trailer the same as this, and it had a little kitchen unit in, a bunk bed here, a bunk bed that side. Uh, the back was cut into a little workshop. Um, bike went in the, in the transit van, but there was a mega little workshop in the back door. You come in here and it was like two little beds and a little kitchen sink and stuff. And I was 18 years old, never been to Northern Ireland before. All I'd seen in Northern Ireland was on the news, all the, the, <laughs> the troubles that they were having back then. So I was 18, I'd get in a boat from Liverpool over to Belfast. My boat arrived at one o'clock in the morning. I was absolutely shitting myself when I arrived over there. And obviously we didn't have like uh, phones with, you know, I didn't even think we had tom-toms then. So I was like, I was map reading as... I'd, I'd had my AA road map out. I'd, I'd listed down all what roads to t- what junction to turn off and all. I had my little list of roads. I was by myself. I was just going over there by Man. by myself, spanning them for myself. And all this. I got there at like, I don't know, two, three o'clock in the morning, parked up, got me down on the trailer, woke up and um, 
someone come out the caravan. There was a, a blue transit van, a caravan parked next to me. And the uh, lad comes out the caravan. Hey, up. And I looked up and it's McGuinness. I'd park next to McGuinness. He was like, what are, you, what are you doing here? I want my wheels back. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what are you doing here? I said, I've come to race. I've got an old steel frame 600. It was a fast Tony Scott engine, steel framed Honda CBR 600. Anyway, um, John was like, what? You come over by yourself to, to race? I was like, yeah, well, you know, What's just the only a couple of wheel changes, a few brake pads or whatever, unless I smash it into a wall. So uh, and, it, and fair play to John, he got stuck in that week and helped us with a you know a few wheel changes and, and what have you. And um, that was back in the days when he had his blue transit van on running on reds and stuff like that. So am I allowed to say that? Of course, yeah. You can tell him tell everyone if he's still doing it now. Would still yeah, look yeah, for it. Yeah. Look, I think I think he had a little switch there that he flicked it <laughs> onto the good stuff. If ever he came into trouble. <laughs> Well, I would know nothing about that. I, I mean, you know, I'm all for putting a bit of red in, but I wasn't that clever to that. To, <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't that clever to put a, a flick switch in and get it back onto the good stuff. <laughs> so anyway, oh my goodness, you're gonna laugh at John. It is funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moses will be around knocking on his door. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was my roads experience. But sorry, just going back to what I was just saying. What an unbelievable experience! The Northwest Two Hundred, my best experience of road racing. The North, Northern Irish people couldn't have looked after me any better. I was over there. Oh, they um, look after, oh, they're Ian Duffus got me in with a, a family. Um, uh, oh, I'm trying to off the top of me. It's Willie Henry and Kay Henry. It was a family run a dairy farm, and uh, of. They had something like 500 cows or something. Anyway, went and stayed on their farm uh, for a couple of nights with them. And the little boys used to get up in the morning, go and help the dad milk the cows. And it was just amazing. They just they just took me in under the wing. And uh, we went to Kelly's nightclub on a on a Thursday night and got yes. wasted. <laughs> the anger bar. Yeah, woke, woke up the next day and some young Irish lady was on, the, on my little bunk next to me. <laughs> How did you get there? <laughs> But, uh, anyway, I wonder, Steve. I wonder. But uh, they, they were the good old days. But what an experience to go to the Northwest 200 and race a bike at them speeds, uh, sample of Northern Irish hospitality. I've never experienced anything like it before or since. And um, I can only say, if ever you get the chance for any young up and coming racers, it's got to be something. You've got to put on the tick box and, and get over get over there and experience. We're going to talk about it really in depth later on in the podcast, but you're like you're coaching now. What would be like? Just a quick question: You're coaching people. Would you ever deter people from going road racing as your <coughs> students, or would you just sit like not, or not just a, and, yeah? Good, good you, question, Don. Because not at all is the answer. I wouldn't. I wouldn't never say to, and that's why I've just said if ever, any young rider ever wants to have the experience. Of road race and go and try the Northwest 200. It is the best road race experience other than the TT, which I've never experienced. But um, yeah, I would never say to no one not to go and don't do it because of my reasons why I didn't do it is personal to myself. Now everyone's different. Everyone ticks, you know, make everyone ticks different up here, don't they? So. Um, and hence why I've always said, mate, I take my hat off to you guys doing the roads at the speed you do. But yeah, it's everyone's personal choice and preference, isn't it? And it annoys me when um, certain riders, maybe later on in the career, which I'm here and now, of uh, oh, going to do the TT or going to do the Northwest, and and straight away people are like jumping negative on them. Oh yeah, well he's skint. He's only doing it because he wants a few quid. In my opinion, that's wrong to, to uh, have that opinion of someone to say they're going to put their life on the line, go to the TT or the Northwest, all for a few quid. Yeah, okay, that's a little pat on the back, at getting a few quid for doing it. But ultimately, you're not going to risk your life for a couple of grand, are you? So it's the experience, in my opinion. If you're going to do it, go over for the right reasons. And, um, you know, it's there's no better way to to get that pulse race and if that's what you're searching for and uh, have a buzz uh, the best fun I've probably ever had racing a motorbike is is the north flat out round the northwest 200 it was 
unbelievable fun. Like you're literally riding with a smile on your face and your helmet. So why was <coughs> why, like sorry, like why was the Northwest such a a can do event then, if you know what I mean? Like the TT was a no for you, the Ulster Grand Prix was a no for you, you know, like the Macau Grand Prix, you know. It's just interesting how a fair few riders like yourself, like high end championship winning material, and they only just keep an eye on the Northwest. So why <coughs> in that in your opinion yeah. is the Northwest uh acceptable it's almost okay. a go-between hey, no no no, yeah. no no don't get me wrong i'm not not no i'm not knocking anyone for that but it's that psychological barrier like isn't it it's like yeah, i'll, I'll go do the I'll north tell you why don't yeah. because simply uh i'm going back uh you know from when i first chose to do the northwest which was 1998 it's simple triangle isn't it yeah. you know it's a nine and a half mile um excuse me triangle it was relatively easy to learn you know you couldn't forget what way you're going left, the main, left, left exactly left, so left. the the main thing you needed to learn was your breaking markers you missed them breaking markers from flat out you're in trouble whereas then committing to go to the tt is just a just a different level of learning and uh discipline and everything yeah. um and yeah so but my reason for not wanting to go to the tt is what i explained to you before we're, before we come in here was uh i could never accept if you're on a lap record breaking lap uh you know in the zone and something happens in front of you and someone's bike blows oil all over the place and you you're in no control i couldn't accept that so that that yeah. was my personal reasons why I always chose not to go to the TT, yeah. and it was only from when, as we said earlier, uh, when Dave Jeffries lost his life in 2003, and I was battling with Dave in the Superstock Championship that year, and me and him uh, and, a, and a host of others were racing at the front and winning races, and the way Dave's accident happened and the way he lost his life, and yeah. he was on a lap record breaking lap, doing nothing wrong, and that was that, and, and I... Got the phone call from my team manager that day to, to tell me, uh, Jed, a guy called Jed Smith in Liverpool here from uh, Lloyd's Auto Body, the team that I race for. And he told me, and I, and I was I was heartbroken. You know, Dave was such a big character in the sport, in person. Um, and for him, I, I'd never really lost anybody close to me like that, you know, friends-wise. Yeah. And it hit me, and, I, and then when I sat back and looked at it and understood how his accidents happened, you know, what was in his control, what wasn't, and I just thought, see, you've done nothing yeah, wrong. Nothing. How, can, yeah. how can it? So that was my personal reason anyway, and, and I'll say it again, I've said it twice, but I've to have the, the conkers on you to go and do what you guys do on any bike, whether it be the classic TT, ride the 125 or a super bike around there, Hats off to you, mate. You deserve every penny you get. No, but fair enough. Like, and that, <clears throat> the good thing is, it's it, you nail your colours to the mast, and I, I respect that. And I think everyone listening to the show, Chris, like it's the fact that you know what you want to do, and I think that's such a valuable life lesson mm. period isn't it it's like i don't want to do that simple as that leave it to it mm. but my god I, w I wish i saw I, you around the north now nah, nah, sorry mate and can i just say you know you guys uh what, what i used to hear back then in the day is oh yeah but on the roads you only you only ride at like 80 90 percent do you bollocks that that last time i rode the northwest 200 was 2008 uh my last race was on a super sport bike I rode every bit as hard in that super sport race to finish fourth. I think it was like a second off the winner. Uh, I can't remember who won. I think it might have been Steve Plato won it. Or, there was a group of about six of us, Hutchie, Guy Martin, Cam Donald, and a few others. And Hutchie was on the grass at one point doing 165 or something flat out on a 600. They'd be on the, behind the bubble like that. And I'll, we're all like drafting each other. And there's a little grass verge. After the grass verge, guess what there is? A ditch and then lines with trees. And Hutchie's on the grass, like dust kicking up. And and I, and I was scratching, like literally fine breaking into, you know, late breaking at the end into all the chicanes and using all of the track. The lads were like taking chunks out of each other. And I was thinking, what happened to the 90%? <laughs> 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 the 90% the was left on the start line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. They were giving 110 percent to it. Good. I, I this don't is know good. Yeah, this is good. Remember back. I think you used to get paid lap money as well. I don't know if it's the same now, but you get you paid the TT. 
Yeah. Right, so is I don't know if it's is it the same at the northwest now? I'm not sure, no. You get paid depends on your position when you on the, the line, when you cross the line. So you can imagine no, that's each when you got back onto the coast roads, everyone was just taking chunks out of each other. You must have been thinking like, oh, bonus, 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 bonus. I can't bonus. remember if I was back in the day, but I, everyone must have been thinking like it's a grand and extra grand. <laughs> You're having it because it's a grand into the chicane. <laughs> and if you didn't pass them on the brakes before the before the flag on that lap, you've just lost the grand or whatever it was. But, yeah, so uh, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> it was hilarious, mate. I, honest to God, I put everything on the line, and I I love the race. I, I come back, I finished fourth. Good that I wasn't on the podium, obviously, but uh, I come back that night. We all got pissed and had a had a good party and whatever. And um, I just remember just thinking, wow, that was just that that was a proper race. Like, <laughs> and and the, you know the coast roads are up and down Black Hill and oh. all the blind crests and all that. And you come over Black Hill on the wheelies <laughs> and you're hanging off the other side. And it's it's memories like that of of the fun you have around there. But then it's are you prepared to Give up what you've got. Give up, uh, sacrifice everything to for that little, for that one hour of fun on the bike there. But it, uh, looking back, it was amazing. The, I can see, you just, see the you're smile. Just talking about it's, it, it's oh, like let a switch. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. But it? It, it, you guys know what it's like. That that um, when you're on the edge on the bike and you're in the zone, you're having so much fun on a on a UK race track, say like of Alton Park when everything's going right and the bike's wheelie and it's hard to control every the Northwest two hundred at such high speeds and you timing the braking and you know on the coast road the, you know the blind sections and all that. It's just and the fans like the, the both sides of the track it's just lines with people. You can say and everyone's just all on the Guinness Source. and yeah, just having a great time. The atmosphere you can, it's hard to explain and um, hence why you see obviously Alistair Seely goes there every year and it must be extra special for him being Irish but uh, it's the biggest outdoor <coughs> sport event in Northern Ireland isn't it no, I, yeah yeah it well, is, yeah. I should imagine so I would personally love to see you over, I would love to have been there to watch you race because it's great how you brought up the Alistair Seely thing because ever since episode 6 when we first had you on we talked about that last they, lap. Sorry, in... mate, are they free? Yeah, yeah, you have to pay for them. <laughs> no, cool. I thought you were never going to offer. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got, is it Gandhi's flip flop? My mouth stuck together. Well, but it does say that on the rich energy label here. <laughs> we'll help with Gandhi's slip out <laughs> 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 Absolutely, guys, but no, so I'm over the moon you brought the Sealy thing because, uh, this last lap, like, i never seen it. And Chrissy, like, we were doing this uh, over Skype and there was no YouTube and everything like that. The good old days, gentlemen, the good old days. And Chrissy's <coughs> like, have you not seen it? I can't. No. Nah. So anyway, he pulls up the computer while we're chatting to you and I'm watching this when we draw on the floor. It's you in... Oh, you were, uh, you were absolutely yeah. pinballed, <laughs> Alistair Seeley. Think... And imagine... No. Sorry, even before you mentioned that race, your style, your aggression, your sheer, utter... I... No, it's only one <coughs> word for it. Fuck it, I'm having it. It's just pinball. It's brilliant. Imagine that. I think that's, the biggest, that's the uh, largest v- views that we've ever had putting a video on. T- I think I put it on Twitter and there was like, I remember seeing like 60 or 70,000 people watched it because obviously oh. McGuinness shared it and Scott Smart on, and everyone knew that. On, everybody <laughs> involved. It's hell, of, hell of a laugh. It, it came up on the memories the other day and I shared it again because it's, uh, it, it is a just, great way. Even if you weren't into bike racing, you would enjoy watching that. Yeah, it was, um, that was just a case of Alistair being killed kicking my ass week in week out uh what bike was he was on the task as if he was near and i was on the blades again and, and, no, and, and another <coughs> top team as well padgett's roads team as well so you're oh, in for some Cl- serious Clive, caliber Clive's team you know as much as i got my ass handed to me on a plate that year by alistair obviously the reigning champion you think i was i would naturally i'd won 10 races the year before so i thought I'm going to win a handful this year and obviously Alistair turned up and was just in the zone and was winning week in, week out and uh, obviously I, I got into the lead. I think it was the last lap I led. Oh, no, sorry, I, I passed him halfway uh, out the back section uh, he halfway you, around the last lap. He I? passed you into tower and then you did yeah, him into the... <clears> on the outside, yeah. on the flip-flop and uh, and I just thought, no, that's it. And I'm going to see him come on the last section before the hairpin he come up the sort of the wrong side of me and then close it. I thought, no, you're not having that. And let the brakes off. And obviously, like, 
Spanners did, it for both of us. Did it ever get that, that season? Did it ever get nasty between you and Alistair, or was it like it, not at all, mate? Not at just all. a real because you just towering over him with no, hundreds, like no, a healthy rivalry. Yeah, no, it was. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Um, you know, we'd say hello to each other, passing in the paddock and whatever. But like any rivalry on on circuit, you, you're not best mates with your main rival, are you? you Way not. You, in a in the nicest way possible, you hate them mm-hmm. because. Not that's the wrong words to use because it's a strong word, but you you, you want to dislike them to make it easier to beat them. So I wasn't best mates on by any means. Mm. Uh, he was beating me every weekend, and I wanted to beat him. And that's uh, that race. I think uh, it was the, mid. The, you know the body language from both of us just showed how much he wanted to win it. But uh, the, how how dramatic of a finish could you get? So McGuinness wheelies over the lap. McGuinness, so you been teammate up. snaps the win off me. I've been like I've finished second about eight times to Alistair. John wins the race. Scott Smart Ducati shits itself over the line. It gloriously, mate. No gloriously. Of smoke and so me and Alistair get gets the bike turns and he out drags me to the line. So. And uh, yeah, but I remember the some of the superbike lads just going out in the next race saying, "Bloody hell, Brogy, what a race!" And um, I think it was Philip Neal said something that like, like had a go on me or something for like he's out of control, and I was just like, "Yeah, whatever." You're damn right, yeah, I'm stay back. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, Clive Padgett, uh, while we're just on the subject of him, what uh, manager and mentor he is. If anyone, well, anyone who's ever ridden for him will know he's such a clever guy in terms of like um, I'd come in and I'd be struggling with a little bit of you know chatter or whatever on the suspension the bike not turning well Clive would be like yeah they are Steve just try a little bit of this or a little bit of that and he's always telling me what he'd do whatever way he went it was always a step forward it was always a positive move but the main thing with Clive you walk into his garage of a morning uh, in, the, in the pits and all the lads and he's like morning Steve morning Clive you alright yep and I won't repeat the the uh, what you'd say to me every morning. Go on, go on, go on, man. Go on, man. Go on. It's too crude. Yeah, was it's it too crude. But piss up some press up. <clears throat> no, no. <laughs> I was just, that was Uncle Don. <laughs> it was. Uh, I won't say. Go it's on, a, it's a bit now. It's a bit, be, it's a bit too crude. But don't be a shy All I can bag. say Come is, on, <laughs> Clive was on the lads' wavelength. Let's just put it that way. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what an atmosphere he had! Everybody, you'd, you'd walk into his garage, you'd be like, "Well, sunshine and we're racing motorbikes, and you know what, what, what can be better?" And it's just like so true. You know, Clive is just like basic and simple. You race a motorbike, it's sunny, and that was that. He's um, hugely beyond huge <coughs> successful at um, the Isle of Man TT. But why is he? He hasn't been a full footing in BSB paddock for a number of years now. He's done like wild cards with like Connor Cummins, and he's done the like, the occasional thing. But when did Padgett stop being that high level, like in the BSB paddock, like putting that effort in? No, not su- high level. Team wasn't it? But he's mainly yeah. focused on the rules. So, for years. example, no, but ba- even now he's like, for example back then. Um, in 2009, I was actually contracted to the HM Plant Honda team to ride for them for another year in Superstock. Yeah. But that was when the recession hit, wasn't it? If you remember right. And so Honda kind of subcontracted me to Clive. So I'm guessing must have give Clive whatever the budget was to run me in the HM Plant team and said, Steve, listen, you know, you'll have to run in Clive's team. Uh, this year because we've had cutbacks and you know had yes, to lay, lay mechanics off and that type of stuff I was like alright fair enough and you know the bike, bikes are the same and this that and other but you'll have different mechanics you're going to run in Clive's colours and all that and, and I'm, I'm not just saying this but I, I had more fun in Clive's team in 2009 even though I got my ass kicked every weekend I had more fun in his team uh, it, just because of the environment that he created um, and I was riding just as hard as I was the year before when I was winning, mm-hmm. thanks to Alistair Seeley. But uh, yeah, it was good. It was good racing. Now, <coughs> when you stopped going to the Northwest, this is before you worked with Clive and BSB. Is that correct, timeline wise? Did you stop the Northwest at that point? Two, th- yeah, two thousand eight was the last time I rode at the Northwest. And then two thousand nine, that was your first year with Clive. Yeah. Do you reckon the story would have been different if you went to the Northwest with Clive? No, you, you know, just um, bouncing an idea well, off your well, head. Well, yes, it, that, for the simple if, fact. If that I, situation I know, didn't... I know Clive's uh, bike preparation 
for the roads would be a bit different than maybe how the official Honda team prepare their bikes. And um, I know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, no, no, you know, I don't you know, want to sit here and I'm not bad mouth. Oh, no, no, no I'm not asking to bad mouth anyone. Yeah, yeah. It's just, <clears> no, what, what's interesting is, so it's like that one scenario with the caliper, uh, like woke up that realization of going, you know, it's not for me. This is out of my control. Fair enough, 100%. Mm -hmm. But when you've got an icon, like the Paget family, mm -hmm. you know, it would it, it it's yeah. just interesting. You, you, look, you look back at Clive's and the Paget, well, the whole Paget team of of the success on the roads, and look when Hutchie won the, the five, five yeah. in, a, in a in a in a week. You know, you you don't win five TTs in a week by pure chance, because as you know, Dom, the TT is is. Yeah, it's man and machine, but a lot on that machine has got to be right, hasn't it? Oh, things, God, oh, God, I. There's a lot of things that can go wrong on the bike in terms of just bits breaking or falling off, rattling and whatever. And whatever Clive does in his and their team preparing their bikes, they obviously do something right, don't they? Cause there, there, there's a special something <clears throat> that go, happens in that team and it so, works. It's, yeah. it's just... It's just a man of your talent, you know what I mean? It's uh, It would have been very interesting. If if life was a little bit different, different world for Steve Brogan, that would have yeah. been Steve Brogan on the Padgets. It, it would have no, been... I have no regrets, mate. That oh, no, no, no. no. But even been... with the HM plant on the team, I enjoyed it. it yes, was, I. It was a brilliant experience. And Now, uh, um... obviously, we've talked quite a lot about your <laughs> yeah, career so far. <laughs> and there's, uh, After the sort of super stock days and the, those sort of glory days of like winning the championship and whatever, um, there were... There was a, f a good few more years before you actually hung up the leathers and went into team, man team management. Yep. And there was a kind of crossover period where you, you ran your own team and you were racing yourself, but you also were sort of, sort it was your team. Um, do you want to just quickly go through, go, go through that and like when you went from after winning the EVO championship, going into setting your own team up and yeah. how, you, how that was? <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously... Um, We'd done the Evo Championship, then the Jensen team uh, stepped up into the main BSB class and got all the fancy Magneti, Morelli uh, electronics, but they never had anybody to operate them, so it was a waste of time. So, again, got my backside kicked. And the bike was brilliant. It's probably the best bike I'd ever raced. I had all the bells and whistles on, but I had no idea with electronics. I didn't know how to operate it. I could come in and say, yeah, the bike's holding me back a bit too much there, or... It's not, you know, the anti wheelies on too much. It's pulling me back too much on the straights and this and that. But they had no one to operate to it to, fix to input anything in. So it, it was a waste of time. So naturally, again, I went back to Superstock Thousand. Um, had a little spell with the Bill Base BMW team, and then twenty thirteen, I was back to running my own team uh, from my garage at the side of my house. Uh, back to Mercedes Sprinter job with a pop up on and um, and thankfully Kawasaki UK uh, supplied me with a bike and uh, some spares and stuff like that and um, but that was my last year racing 2013 um, and I'd had a. I had the best of everything, basically. I had a, the latest ZX10,000. Uh, I had all the tyres that I needed, a good mechanic, enough spares, enough budget in case the bike crashed. There was no excuses, basically. But I had a little knock on the head uh, the year before in a uh, qualifying crash on the Bill Base bike. Somebody pulled out of the pits at Brands going into paddock, and I was, I'd come over the start finish flat out, mm -hmm hit the brakes into paddock on a qualifying lap and someone come out the pits, never looked over the shoulder and I literally missed them by that much. But I I, uh, I didn't go straight into the gravel ahead. I turned the bike a little bit, so I was at least going down the hill a bit, but I was going to run off the track. So I picked the bike up, run through the gravel, as soon as I hit the gravel, straight over the handlebars, knocked my head. Uh, and I must have been knocked out for like <clears throat> literally... Five seconds, something like that. Jumped up, I was fine physically. Goes back to med centre, get me all checked out, and doctor said, um, "Hi, Steve. What uh, what track are we at?" And I was like, looking for signs around. So, you know, I was like, don't know. He said, uh, "What day is it?" I was like, don't know. But almost like I wasn't really that bothered. The fact that I didn't know the answers because I knew I'd be all right and. You know, they were just simple questions. And, and um, Tegan, my wife, was stood behind, uh, holding Ben, my son. 
And uh, the doctor said, is that you? Is that is this your son, is it? And I said, yeah. He said, how old is he? And I was like, don't know. And with that, I just burst into tears. I feel emotional talking about it now. Um, it, it hit me because obviously I knew how important the question was and the fact that I didn't know the answer. And I didn't really understand how much that, that one question impacted me until a year later and when I was racing as I say in my last year 2013 on the ZX10 I was putting everything on the line what I thought was on the line but I was always about half a second 0.6 off and as you know Chrissy if you're half a second off in stock thousands there was once I was one time that year I think I was like 0.7 off and I was 19th on the grid and I was like, nah. and I was just sat there thinking, what am I doing? It's game over. Ship's gone, you know. So then, obviously, um, everything that I built up that year, we, you know, got a nice little setup on an on, on on the side of the van and all the rest of it. And then, so I thought, right, I had, I had a good sort of few sponsors around me. So I thought, well, I, I've sort of learned too much just to throw it all away. I want to put a bit more back into it. So. Um, expanded a little bit, got a bigger truck, and um, uh, got the services of Adam Jenkinson and Victor Cox to come and ride for us in and compete in Stock Thousand Kawasaki team, and uh, everything was all done. And as per usual, every year with me, my main sponsor, which was Direct CCTV, uh, based down in Darford <laughs> for a scout slab, what a scout, sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> well, here we go again. <laughs> and, You're the uh, perfect advert because we caught you, Steve. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, every year we just do a handshake deal, you know, like agree whatever the deal was and how much, you know, paid whenever, and we just shake hands and that was that. And it was always, it was always good for the money and good for his words. And um, if anything, he always done done more than he was originally saying. Uh, so I shook hands on the deal and all the rest of it and everything was all in place and we got a new workshop and I literally renovated the whole workshop and um, like made it all safe and secure. Got Kawasaki delivered us two brand new ZX-10s, got them all built and prepped. We went and done a test over in Almeria in Spain. Everything was brilliant. The, the team atmosphere was great. Me, Adam and Victor, we drove over in the van with the bikes. <clears throat> a bit of a... Um, kind of team bonds and if you like it on the way over there just to sort of get the band to go and then, and so the mechanics flew over there to spain and then we flew home me and adam and victor flew home and the mechanics drove home so just to, to share this so the mechanics didn't feel like they were being treated like donkeys if you like so um but yeah what a, what a start to the season like the test was really good the lads were flying the bikes were good um we were on max and suspension, so we had uh, Richard over with us, um, and everything was just brilliant. It was just the perfect start of the season, although the money was a little bit slow coming in, so it was a bit of a concern, but I always knew, you know, the guy who I was dealing with, it was always good for his word. Anyway, um, as the as we were getting into the races, the, uh, the money still wasn't coming in, and then all of a sudden I was having to run accounts up and based on trust and this, that, and the other. And, uh, yeah, anyway. Slippery slope. Exactly. And and the long and short of it was, I think the company lost a big deal with Amazon. Uh, a lot of business they used to do with Amazon. And all the directors from the company said, no, we're not putting no more money into the race. And that was that. But I was being told... It yeah, was coming, it was coming. coming. You're going to get an X amount by such and such a date and never come. To say I was broken hearted is an understatement. It was like what I, what myself and my wife Tiga put into that team, running that team that year um, for the lads. And obviously because I knew I had the two, the two lads' careers in my hands and I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want to let any of the other sponsors down. So I wanted to keep everything going and done everything I could to keep them going and in the end uh, you know the lads just said listen we're going to have to leave it because we had so many spares in the truck to to go for a few crashes but if the, if we had a decent barrel roll or something that was it, yeah. we were knackered and I said to the lads you know if if it, it, the, the, the tipping point for them was like I said to them 
it was like round five <clears throat> guys if if you have a crash from now on it's on you you know i haven't got no more resources to, to sort the bikes out and at that point they just said well let's call it a day and i was i was in tears again you know because it was like it broke me emotionally because i put so much into it i knew the lads were gutted but i felt like a letdown to them and uh it was something that i really enjoyed while it lasted um and I would, I would like to do it again in the future because I feel like all my passion and uh, my knowledge that I've gained over the years of, of, of running my myself in teams. You know, I've had to run myself for Super Stock Thousands, and we finished seconds in the Stock Thousand Championship in 2007, running my own little team out of a pop-up one and sprinter at the side of my garage of the house against the WFR team who had. Two big Budget, Arctic, yeah. two big Arctic trucks, X amount of bikes, loads of staff, and it was just me and two of my mates that I used to pay every weekend to come and mechanic for me. So, I, f- I definitely feel I felt like I wasn't ready to stop as a as a a team manager and mentor back then. So, obviously, the team folded. That was the rest. That was the end of that. And. Uh, I was like, right, what do I do next? Which then, obviously, we had to sell up all the all the assets of the race team to settle all the bills and and stuff. And then um, it was like, what next? So hence, when I went into coaching, and we'll, we'll come back to the coaching. <coughs> and uh, I also want to touch a little bit about like sort of life after racing and that sort of period of time. But um, just something that you just touched on it before about the the thing with the, the kids and the the crash and how that you felt that sort of was a bit of a turning point and you kind of knew the the ship had sailed it's very difficult for riders that are racing currently you can't really get an honest answer out of them about the the chain having kids and racing because obviously they're not going to when they've got a team to sponsor they're not going to say oh well actually it's it uh, you know i don't i don't go for as many you know risks or whatever but it's so you're in a a bit of a unique position where you know you've you've away from the sport now so you can talk about it honestly but do you my first question is: So, do you do you what was it that you felt that sort of changed? You know the, about the kids and uh, having kids, and also how do you think people like you know people who make it work, like say Johnny, and like, you've got plenty of friends who have kids, but seem to make it work. Yeah. there's a lot of family. Yeah. How do they manage good, it? Good question, because obviously you've got one end of the scale. You've got Jonathan. John, let's look at Jonathan Ray and use him. As as he's your role model dad, if you like, racer dad, because he's got his two little boys, which are similar age to my two boys. Johnny's obviously off around the world, and I know because um, I speak to Johnny quite a bit. The main thing is for him, he misses his kids when he's away from him and his and his family. But in terms of um, motivation and stuff, I know for him, his boys are his motivation. A lot of what he does, he, and he does it for them, you know. And he uses that as a motivation, having his kids and wanting to do well for them. Uh, and as I say, I think just the time away from his kids is, is the only thing that sort of does them a little bit. Um, in terms of like the fear of, of crashing and stuff, I don't... Uh, well, you can see from his results, it, it clearly doesn't bother him, does it? So, um, But I think it wouldn't bother you until until you do have a crash and you, you're affected in such a way that it, it then bothers you and you, you think of the possibility of what your life would be if if or but or whatever, you know. So everyone's different. I, I guess it goes back to like the TT question, doesn't it? You know, um, everybody's lives are so different, you know, and to... If we're all the same, it would be shite, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly, mate, exactly. And it's... It's a hard one because it's everyone's trying to find a balance in life with the, with ha, you know any dads or racer dads, um, having your kids. For me personally, now I I love being away from racing, and I value my weekends at home with the boys, going taking them out on the bikes and to the skate parks and, or you know whether the bikes are just on the TV over weekends and. The bacon butties are on the go, and the coffee, and the boys are jumping all over me, and we're having a fight in the, you know, in the house or whatever. Um, I I love that now being away from it and spending my weekends with the boys, rather than um sort of the other end of the scale, 
if I was away from them every weekend. So I can understand that side of it that, uh, you know, that really hinders Johnny a little bit, being away from his family, because, you know, you, you miss your kids. But ultimately, he's doing it for them, isn't he? So, If you don't mind me asking, um, how about your boys racing? Is that something that you want to see, or is that something that you just say, you're, you're more laid back than the deflated Lilo, and that's why I like you. Like, you know, everything's good. You know, you're like, oh, no, yeah, if you want to do that, I'll help you. You know, you'd help, you know, if they wanted to be snooker players, I can imagine you'd be taken down to the pool club every night. But, you know, if they came up to you, seeing what the dad's done, and, you know, what your wife, you know, yeah. she's been part of the paddock for years as well, and you go, oh, actually, I want a piece of that. Yeah, I would, but, um, and again, I've been asked a few times this time of these. Uh, so yeah, it's something that I don't want to. I don't want to uh, push them into or whatever, you know. And um, they've they've got a little bike, and if they want to go on it, no problem. But racing's not something I want. I want my kids to do but only because yeah. uh, I'd want if they wanted to do it. If they come to me and was like, "Dad, I want to race a bike," or "I want to get a bike," and I want to. I've watched this kids mini bike club. I want to. I want to have a go of that. Well, they'd have to show me that they really wanted to have a go before yeah. I went and got them a bike for that particular, you know, little racing club or get them all the gear. They'd want to show to me. They'd, sorry, they'd, they'd have, have to, to meet show. you down the middle. That's what my dad would yeah, make. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not just going to say, "Dad, I want to have a go of that." I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay, Benj or Brody, I'll get you a bike and." There you go. They'd have to want it to. I'd have to see that. He, what the hell? He really wants to have a go at this. Well, if that was the case, then obviously I'd give them. They'd have my hundred and ten percent back and yeah, and experience to to try and help them. Um, you know, get into it, keep them safe for one, and and give them as many little tips, uh, you know, tricks of the trades as I possibly can. But it's not something I'm going to push it, push them into. I'm open. Yeah. I'm open to get into golf or something. Golf. <laughs> I think there's uh, a bit more money. <laughs> I was probably, I thought you were going to say football. Football, football fo- players. They are. If you want to play football or golf or something like that, something a bit less dangerous. So. Mm-hmm. Um, God, I... And getting on to the, <clears throat> the sort of life after race, and obviously it's uh, f- from do we're on episode ninety eight. We've spoke to so many ex racers, and you know, there's always that period. For some people, it's a few months. For some people, it's years. <clears throat> but there's a period after racing where there's kind of a big hole in your life, which has been such a, a passion, and kept, you know, you like it's an obsession, isn't it? You you spend all your weekends, all your time, all money, everything, and then all of a sudden, there's that sort of big hole. Um, how did you find the sort of the initial period after you you walked away from racing? Um, quite difficult, if I'm honest. Um, obviously, uh, the the boys were really young, were babies, and uh, then all of a sudden, you know, there was no race team. I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't racing. There was no race team. I wasn't going away of a weekend. Um, <clears throat> and I was like, what am I going to do of a weekend now? So. I was kind of like, it, it really did hit me to the point where for 20 years while I was racing, I was that focused and driven on racing and training and getting on the scales every other day, checking my weight and all the rest of it and never really being able to kick back and, and have a drink whenever you wanted to over weekends weekend or whatever. And uh, I fell into a little bit of a slippery slope uh, when... The boys would go to bed of a night, obviously, you know, when they're young, like two or three or whatever, and crack a bottle of wine open with Tiger watching the TV. And Tiger's not a drinker by any means. So, you know, they'd open a bottle of wine, watching the TV or whatever, boys would be fast asleep upstairs. And uh, she'd have, like, a little glass of, you know, a little glass of white wine and sit there with the same glass all night. And before I knew it, that bottle had gone. Then there'd be another bottle cracked open, and then I'd go to bed like that, you know, spanned after two two bottles of wine in the night. But then it become a little bit of a habit. Aye. And I was drinking. A bit of a buzz kind I, of thing. I, well, it was like I enjoyed going to bed like half cans off <laughs> off a off a like a bit of wine. Say a bit of wine, two bottles of wine. But it it become a bit of a habit and it was like three three times four times a week two bottles of wine and I was like ne- obviously next thing I put weight on and I wasn't training obviously the, the, I stopped training when I stopped racing then I started drinking so I started to put weight on and I'm not talking drinking alcoholic drinking 
just a bad habit. Like I, I'd, I'd be the first one to wake up in the morning before tea get and be straight flat out with the kids doing the breakfast and, um, you know, getting the jobs done. Well, yeah, whatever, doing whatever was going to be done. I wasn't like hangover the next day. Uh, is that an alcoholic? If you if you if you haven't got no, a hangover no, no, and you no, can no. drink two bottles of wine, no, that's called good practice. <laughs> no, no, no. alcoholism <laughs> like it's pretty much you wake up and you just you're thinking about the drink. Right, you know oh, what I mean? wasn't that bad. No, no, I've got a bit to go there. Well, got, I've got a bit more. I've got practice. a bit of progress to go. That's yeah. it, if sitting, so, um, but yeah, so uh, I, I was just yeah, I was just trying to fill the void at the, the buzz that bike racing gives you every weekend. And then <clears throat> I really, really enjoyed sitting at home watching. Um, so obviously, Chrissy, when you guys were out there and I, I watched MotoGP, MotoGP got a bit boring at one point, didn't it? And I sort of wasn't bothered if I missed watching MotoGP because you could always predict the winner, Marquez, all the time. And so I kind of stopped watching that. World Tour Bike was, was brilliant to watch. BSB is always exciting. So I was, I was like glued to the telly and obviously... I know all the all the BSB tracks inside out, and you you kind of know the teams and all the team members, and most of the characters. And I was like, I was just glued to it every weekend. Would never miss a session. I was watching you obviously on uh, TSL time, and when I wasn't there and stuff, and um, absolutely loved it. But it was hard. It was hard, mate. It was a hard. Uh, it was a hard void to fill of me weekends and. Um, it's got better. I don't drink nowhere near as much as I used to when I first stopped racing. Um, I'd say I'm just a social weekend drinking out. But um, I, I love just taking the kids out. Now, the boys are at such a good age, the six and eight, and uh, they've got BMXs, and we go to like the um, kids' little bike tracks and um, you know skate parks and stuff like that and have a fight on the grass and stuff like that. And, and it's really good. nice that you've managed to, to keep <clears> hold of the, the passion and obviously your the, the skill set that you've got and sort of and set up a, your own business now, but you sort of bef- the, the leading to setting up your own coaching business. There was um, t- like working for other, other uh, companies and whatever and being able to use that sort of knowledge that you've built. It's your, it's your trade at the end of the day, isn't it? The, Motorcycling is your trade. Yeah, exactly. And it's 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 weird, isn't it? Because like, there's not many people can say. Uh, you know, people say if someone asks me, "Oh, what, what do you do for a living?" I'm a motorbike uh, race Man. race attract a coach. Well, how, how do you become a, a race attract a coach? Well, because uh, I'm, I raced, I'm, I'm brilliant. I raced pretty <laughs> much professional from when I was 16 when I left school. And then to living from it from when I was 16 onwards, you know, don't get me wrong, I had little jobs when I was in my late teens to keep me going in between racing and stuff, but I, I earned money from racing when I was 16 right through to, to when I stopped racing and then, and that was all I ever known and I learned a lot along the way through the hard way of doing it, you know. The only coaching I ever, ever got was off Ron Aslan when I was 17. I jumped off a, a pretty super team bike onto Philip McCallan's Motorcycle City fully tuned Tony Scott CBR 600. And it was because I'd won the, the Super Team Championship. They let me race. Philip McCallan was injured, so I raced a super sport bike that same weekend. So I was riding a production uh Aprilia RS 125 and the Super Team class that weekend and a, a British Super Sport 600. A high-end one as well. <laughs> so I was I was trying to ride the 600 like in my 125 two-stroke style and uh, Ron Aslam got behind me because I think he was competing still at the same time and he was like, Steve, get that bike off the side of, off the, side of the tire. He said, you're running into the corners way too fast. Everything's grounding out on the, on the side. He said, how are you getting away with the lean angle on that 600 is beyond me. He said, you're entering the corner much faster than him. So he, I'd gap him on the entry, but then from the middle of the corner to the exit, he was like that right up my back. And he said, I, I'm nudging you up the back because he said, I've got your bike's flat because I was going in a gear too high. to So I, I didn't have no engine braking. So I'd run in real fast. Closed gas, typical one two star, uh, one two five riding style, freewheeling fast. Then when I come out, the bike was flat, and and he was like a gear bill lower <laughs> than me, and he was like, like ready to like the back up coming out, and I couldn't get my head around that for such a, a bit of time. And 
Ron was the only person who who gave me a heads up on that one area. But <clears throat> to, to the adaption from uh, one two five two stroke to the super sport, how to ride a super sport bike, I high sided so many times trying to learn that I was coming out of corners and I was getting overtaken coming out of corners, but. I was trying to get on the gas earlier in the gear too high with too much lean angle. So what happens? The back came round, let go, and just pinged me up in the air. And it hurt every time, every high side, as you guys all know. <laughs> it's uh, not a high side that doesn't <clears throat> hurt. <laughs> but you don't. It's it's weird. You don't really see that many high sides these days, do you? To be honest. Oh, like, touch wood. Touch not, wood. Touch wood. Chris, touch wood. To, <laughs> not compared to back in the day. Uh, You'd oh, see high sides unri- going off every corner. The unridables, the 502 stroke. Exactly. Days. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, le- I learned the hard way myself. And, and I just thought, when I, when I stopped racing, I thought, that's all I know. And so many people could benefit from everything that I've got. Get on, me, son. <laughs> everything that I've got locked up in here. Um, if, I can, if I can translate what's in here, now I've learned it. To people that need that knowledge to shortcut them to you know from making the mistakes and ultimately go faster then then that would be a good way to go knowledge is 100 percent power now i tell you what we were uh, reading uk club sport and glenn Irwin actually he, he very openly said like uh, why pay a coach or a mentor you mm. know to come tell you how to ride a bike and you know that that's I a read, big controversy for your trade yeah, mind isn't no, it i read that because chrissy forwarded me the article because uh, he said obviously right. I, I featured in it with him because i was chrissy's coach and uh, not many people will know that I coached you for two years, didn't I, Chrissy? Uh, and to answer, um, it kind of bugged me a little bit when I read Glenn's argument in that um, right. article because he was like, "Well, well, why pay somebody X, Y, Z when you can just come to the likes of us and ask for the information and we'll give you it for free?" Uh, yeah, okay, I get, I get Glenn's point. You know, don't don't pay. You know, don't be giving all your money to somebody when you can just come and ask for it for free. Yeah, one or two questions, great, but you're not going to have a personal coach there talking you through every scenario that you could, you know, all the wrong things that you're going to do and, and shortcut you the fastest route. So, and it's not like for myself personally, I've never gone out there touting myself about oh damn, you okay? Do you need any coaching? I'll, I'll come and coach for you, and this Aye. is how much it's going to cost. Chrissy came to me when I was coaching over in Spain and said, Steve, um, I'm racing in Stock Thousand. Um, he said, you said to me, didn't you? I'm like a second, a second and a bit off or sometimes just under a second off the fastest. He said, I've hit a bit of a brick wall. Uh, you know, I need to bridge that gap. But in terms of like bike setup and me riding and stuff, I don't really know where I'm going to get that an extra second. Do you think you can help me? And if so, how can you help me? So I said, of course I can. Um, so me and Chrissy were we were working together, weren't we, with focused events on the track days, and Chrissy was living and training. I was over about to say, it. is this in Spain when you had yeah. that, years in a dirty caravan, <laughs> pouring Chris, yourself out? Chrissy was living. In, what a right, good uh, time over there. Yeah, you were li- you were living the dream, weren't you? You were doing a bit of work and training and, and, and everything over there in Spain, ready for the season. So I said, obviously, yeah, no problem. So I, this is how I can help you if you, you know, if you want me to. So obviously then the next question, how much? And, and, and I'm like, you know, in an ideal world, I'd like to go and do it. We're all passionate about the sport. I'd like to do it for free, no problem. But unfortunately, I've got a wife and kids that and I've, mortgage, got to, yeah. I've got to leave on them weekends across what 12 weekends through the year and some of them are bank holiday weekends and i value my time with my wife and my kids so i said christian it's like so i explained this to you then i said that i want to do it. i'd like to do it for free because I, I like i like it i want to see you succeed i want to help you but i'm gonna need paying so anyway um christy was like yeah no problem trade for I'll, trade i'll speak yeah. to my dad we'll we'll figure it out and and to make it happen, uh, end up coaching Jordan Gilbertson as well, didn't I, in uh, Superstock Super 600. 
to and you basically split the cost between them and what have you. Anyway, it, it worked out great. And Steve came in. And it, it, it was a coach, but also it was the mission racing days. And uh, so there was me and Jordan in the team. And I, I was in stock thousand. I was Jordan was six, stock six hundred. And at the time, I, I'd finished. I'd finished ninth in the stock thousand championship the year before. And Jordan had finished. I think Jordan was about twentieth in stock six hundred. And um, as well as a sort of coach, we didn't really have a sort of crew chief figure, so it was a lot more than just a. You're a lot more than just a coach that year, really, weren't you? <coughs> uh, was, coach would be the name, but you you were very influential in terms of setting the bike up, and it was it, it was a very uh, influential role, and uh, we, we went on to ha- it, have a, a brilliant season race, and and um, despite not really having uh, much much knowledge and infrastructure were challenging the sort of the bigger soup stock teams you know regularly on the podium and so that that was exactly the jump that i wanted and that's the that's the conversation that we had at the start of the season but sort of more impressively jordan it, it was jordan's fourth year in stock 600 and the three years preceding that it was he was mainly outside the top 20 and that year he, he was he finished second in the championship he was breaking lap records lots of podiums so he'd had three years of doing the same thing and even more impressively he was on the same bike as what he was the year before they didn't they didn't do anything to that bike so from going from like well outside the top 20 this is it when i read that article as well i can <coughs> I, I get i think what glenn was kind of was um not warning against but he was kind of pushing away was the because ta- there is people that would go around the paddock and like you need me you need me, you need me and trying to sell themselves and you've never been like that and i think to be fair i think that's what he was talking about mm. but at the end of the day glenn's talking from a position where his dad is an unbelievably successful ro- racer himself and for example when glenn's younger brother andrew came over and when graham come over glenn's with them oh, mm. he's coaching them he's he's doing what you did for me exactly. but but I, I I don't come from a racing family. The first time we went to Cadwell Park, we didn't. I, I never knew what any of their <clears> tracks <throat> looked like. We didn't. Know, I remember people teaching us how to bloody put tire warmers on. We, it would cl- literally clueless from yeah. the start. So to have somebody that had been there, done that, and um, it it was exactly what I needed. And there's lo- there's lots of things. Do you know? Do you know if if somebody who writing a note? Sorry, if, I'm not being ignorant. If yeah. somebody who didn't know anything um, or who hasn't done it themselves came over and said, you know, you need to be in fourth there, and you you can you can take that corner flat out, and you're like, oh, do you think? And he's like, oh, 100 percent, you can take that flat out. If somebody's been there and done that, you you respect that opinion a lot more. And um, yeah, and it, a whole range of things. It's not just pointing things out on the track. It's the whole package. It's yeah. you know advising. Ha- I remember. I remember just little things like um, you know one morning I'd say get up and I'd, I would say have tracky bottoms on. It would be oh Chrissy, just stick some jeans on. Just make yourself look presentable. Just l- l- loads of little things. Yeah. But it's it's making that full package about how you know present yeah. to sponsors, get the whole thing sorted. So so obviously I, I um, there's so that's many some, things. That's some sales pitch for you, Stephen. It is. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> to, to, wait, listen, I'll, I'll show you how we get out of here. <laughs> Um, going, going back to Jordan, uh, Jordan Gilbert, young six hundred uh, stock so stock six hundred rider, and when we when I started working with him at the start of the first season when I was with you, and uh, <clears throat> I went out around the track watching him, and I think at first Jordan and his dad were like, "Well, yeah, well, what, what are we really going to get out of this?" And mm, they, that's they, that, yeah. you know, you're paying somebody a, a, a good chunk of money to be there for you for the weekend. And you're thinking, well, is this going to be justified? And for me, it was like black and white. It was so easy to see the mistakes he was making. So goes around the track, and I was watching him, and I was uh, it was Brands Hatch Indy Circuit it round one, and I'm at the start of uh, Clearways on the outside, opposite the garages, and and Jordan comes round onto the start finish, and I'm bearing in mind I'm watching everybody else, so I'm seeing what all the other, all the other kids are doing on their six hundreds, and the oh, hey, bah, you know. To, like if they if they're shutting off to change gear because they don't have quick shifters, they just shut off a little bit. Yeah, Jordan comes past and he's the only one in the whole field doing it. Where uh, clutching uh, like on a road bike uh, uh, using a clutch, and I was like, what? I've never seen anyone on a race bike use a clutch to change up the gears in my life. So I comes back to the pits and I said, Jordan. Are you using? I need gl- more money off you, mate. I, I know said, how to fix this. Listen, <laughs> I said you're using the clutch going up the gears, aren't you? And he said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, all the come, yeah." 
I said, mate, don't do that. It, it That just takes it so much longer to change gear and a much clunkier and stuff. So I said, don't use the clutch going up the gears. Just use it going down the gears nice and smooth down the gears, right? Let's just eliminate that because that, round a brand's indie circuit, is half a second. It knocks all your All day, arms. all day. And there's not many gear changes around brands in here. I said, but, you know, there's a few tenths of a second worth it. Anyway, that was just, that was the level where he started at the start of the first round. And if somebody had told me <clears throat> at the first round then, Jordan would win two races by the end of the year and finish and battle for the championship, but finish second in the championship. Could have won the championship, couldn't uh, he? Yeah, the last race I'd, of the I'd, I'd, I'd have laughed because... The young kid that I was watching changing gears with using a clutch going up and he was 25th or 26th position. He was a mile off anywhere near being a front at runner. the front. But I, once we started working with him, I could see the determination in him, the, the aggression and everything. And, and my job was to try and just con control it and channel it in the right direction and and get them to use it in the right times of, you know, the right times of the session. So what I I tried to do was structure the sessions for them and say, right, no, you know, simple things like uh, go out with a certain amount of fuel in, you know, not fill the tank. Is it, his dad would fill the fuel tank up and almost the start of a session. I'd say just put however many litres we need to, you know, calculate what it's doing per lap. Um, go out on a used tyre and then pull in. And I'd, I'd try and time it, pull him in when everybody else was coming in for their tyre. So I'd get him on his new tyre first so that he would go out on the track when everybody else was in the pits changing their tyre and he'd get a good clear lap then because that was half of the battle in Superstock is trying to tie, time your tyre change when everybody else was, uh, when the track's quiet. Just little things like that, little tricks of the trade, but working with Jordan was and seeing his pr progress was unbelievable and I got great satisfaction. And also yourself, Chrissy, obviously, um, it's been so satisfying uh, to see you go on to what you've done last year, or even though I wasn't working with you last year, but having worked with you for two years and seeing the mistakes that you were making, and I want to say mistakes, they were just, it was, wasn't really a mistake, it was just trying to change and adapt your riding style and get the bike up in different places at different times at parts of the corner to get the best out of it, and you're talking about um, bridging the gap of, of three, four tenths of a second a lap, and in a, a young rider's head who's never done it before, if you want to shortcut that that little bridge, that gap, uh, in, t in time terms of, of four tenths or half a second, by having a rider coach that somebody like myself, without trying to feel like I'm blowing my own trumpet here, but I'm trying to justify where a rider coach like myself comes in for you mm -hmm. to answer Glenn's criticism of a of a rider coach so all you've done basically was shortcutted um the mistakes that you you could have made and i corrected you in a few areas and taking nothing away from you you do, you've done you've done all the results yourself you do, you put all the hard work in training running um all i done was put a little couple of pieces of the jigsaw in and and helped you uh, structure some of your sessions mm -hmm. in certain times Can and and to say you've gone on to win the British Championship a year later, for me, sat at home last year uh, during all the lockdown and watching TSL and all that, I was so proud to see you go on and do what you've done. Oh, and you. especially for your dad, because I know your dad really well and I've got a good relationship with your dad. I know how passionate your dad has been. And your dad's a bit like myself, quite an emotional guy and passionate. Um I, I was I was as chuffed for your dad as I was for you as well to see you go on after success that you did. Can I just say we had the, that the, the year that you've just been talking about there, 2017, we had some amazing times. And uh, one of the first things at the very first round, 
considering we didn't really know how the season it might have even been testing we didn't really know how the season was going to go and uh steve got me and jordan together and said um right when when we i remember him saying when not if when uh you both win a race on the same weekend this this uh season oh, yeah, we're all going to shave our heads every single person in the team's going to shave the hair and so it was like right deal so we shook on it and uh it got to silverstone right and, and jordan, jordan but, but let's just let me just paint the picture jordan He's a little Essex boy. No, no, Essex, is he? Uh, Essex. It's, the, it's the other side. But... West Sussex or whatever. Yeah, yeah. S- Southerner. And he's all like, his hair was perfect. Nice comb over. He used to go and get like a 40 quid haircut. Oh, like, sure, man. 40 quid haircut. Hair that dumb gel, is a hair. Like... There wasn't a hair out oh, of place. Yeah, and he dumb. shook hands on it that day, thinking, oh, well, I'm safe. Cause I'm just going to roll. <laughs> back then, I don't think he... Maybe he even thought that he was going to win a race, did he? Mm-hmm. And anyway, got to Silverstone. He won his race, so got a. He's no, looking no, at you. Knock Hill was his first one, yeah. so he shaved everything off at Knock Hill, and uh, I finished second that day. I was like. T- uh, maybe a t- half a tenth off Danny off the for the win, win. Yeah. and then um, at uh, Silverstone Jordan went out won the f- won the race in the morning and um, I I'd, I'd led the led most of the race and with two corners to go took the front and crashed you and dick the, the, if, if I'd won that race the whole team were getting the head yeah, shaved but yeah there was, <clears> so, there was some brilliant times that year and you know thing it was a very sort of family team atmosphere you know karaoke's on a night barbecues it, 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 I'll give a special shout out to Russ and Nick and everyone that was involved with the team that year and I've, the Gilberts no longer are sort of at the race and now they, yeah. Jordan stepped away from the race which is a shame but uh, they're a huge miss especially to me and my family because we spend a lot of time with the Gilberts Click Buy Deliver with remote purchasing from the two time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year Colchester Kawasaki Proud sponsors of Chasing the Race In Going back to the whole uh, pros and cons of coaching so um, as you know, I, I spend quite a bit of time with Hodgie and uh, he obviously manages Alex Lowe's and um, works closely with Alex and, and, and other riders that he speaks to in MotoGP. And I suppose I've had the same com- conversation with uh, Neil about coaching and, and you know, uh, what does the rider coaches do for other riders in, in World Tour Bike or MotoGP? And he said, Rossi has a he has a rider coach. I don't know who he is, what his name is. The stick from Tokyo. He has somebody out there spotting mm. for him and doing stuff. Now a rider coach at that level <clears throat> isn't telling them, you know, Still get off the bike here, get off the but you, you know they're, they're identifying the differences between you and and the others and coming back and giving you that information. So. Johnny, and it's, Johnny Ray's got uh, Matt, uh, is it Mariah, is no that? Fabian Ferre. Fabian Ferre. Uh, yeah, I, I think Fabian still works for him. Yeah, but anyway, Kawasaki have in the riders' contract. It's a must. They must have. They must a rider bring a coach. spotter. No, no, oh, no. Right, sorry. So yeah, right, whatever yeah, you want to call yeah, it, spotter, yeah, yeah. rider coach. But there's uh, X Y Z provided in the budget for for a rider coach, and they've got to have it, in, and that's in their contract and. Um, after listening to your pods with Sean Muir, mm. um, and it was really good uh, pods um, watching Sean because obviously I've known known of Sean and his team for years, and it was you know good insight into all the different years of his race. And then I dropped Sean a message uh, afterwards saying that are his guys sorted with rider coaches and and what have you. And he said uh, he said the same. He said I, I provide. A bit of budget for the lads. The lads have both got the the got rider theirs, coaches yeah. or spotters, whatever you want to call them. And um, but he said he he provides a bit of budget um, in their wages specifically for a rider coach. So it just shows at the the, the level racing has got to now. Um, you know, you're talking on tenths of a second here and there, and if you do everything you do, you can do possibly to prepare yourself right through the week. Um, you know your bike setup's perfect, and but you you, you just want an extra set of eyes out there on the, on a the racetrack to see what you're doing right or wrong. It's a no brainer. 
um, can I? Ju- I've just remembered this, and I must must mention it. Do you know that race I was telling you about, the, the Silverstone race, where I, I crashed with two corners to go. The, there was like a big build up to that race that makes it such a oh, such an emotional yeah, yeah. time, and it was a such a, a shame that I crashed really, because um, basically the the round before that, this, this was one of those moments that do you know when you when you really need somebody by your side, and. Um, Basically, what happened was I, I had a one of the best rides I've ever had at Cadwell Park. It was uh, Danny Buck and myself and Richard Cooper fighting for the win. And, you know, it was such a proper race, squash. Yeah, yeah. D- taking chunks out of each other. And um, I f- r- rolled my socks. I finished second. Danny won. I was second. Richard Cooper was third. And um, after the race, the, the obviously the bikes get taken into the, the technical area. And um, my bike was fully stripped down. And the... I'm, uh, the I will just say before I t- tell this story, I'm not having a go at anybody, at, at, you know, BSB and stuff. Everyone makes mistakes, but uh, this is just the facts of what happened. The um, my, when my bike was stripped, one of the things that they <coughs> checked was the cam timing, and to check the cam timing on the BMW, you, there's a there's a tool to you you put it in and you get everything lined up, all the chains lined up, and then there's a there's a tool that fits on. It's a, a cam setting tool. It's the one that you set your cam timing. Yeah, the top for, dead center and yeah. it stops the ta- yeah. Time well, anyway, when yeah. when they went to check it, sorry, it's a cam tight. You've got a cam timing setting tool and a cam timing checking tool. There's two. Different yeah. tools, isn't it? Well, and, and anyway, when so it, which I didn't know at the time. Yeah. So without um, preparing and getting everything lined up, they just went to they try to put the the setting tool on, and it wasn't going on because obviously they hadn't lined everything up. So therefore, it got announced that I was disqualified, disqualified from the race. It was out in the press. Uh, all of bike sport news and stuff that I disqualified, lost my prize money, and every, all of my achievements from that year that would worked so hard for. There was just Questioned. a massive question mark. But it, and obviously, <coughs> everyone thought we were cheating. Well, um, we knew. But sorry. at this, can I just say, at this point, um, and I, I knew that it was a hundred percent a mistake because that bike was staying in my garage and I was paying for all of the, the maintenance and stuff. So people were saying, oh, it might not be. People were saying, oh, don't worry, we don't think you're a cheat, but like somebody's done it. And it was like, no, I pay for every single bit that goes into that bike. I know that that's, I've had that engine since it, since we bought it and I knew 100% that that cam time had never been from- taken. But everybody around us was saying, like sort of patronising and saying, don't, don't worry or whatever. So me and Steve were down to, uh, went down to see... Alan and the BSB yeah. things, and basically the the scrutineers were just just said no that you definitely are. We we were saying please uh, seal the engine so we can't touch it and take it and get it checked. We know a hundred percent that that's a legit engine, and um, they they just have none of it. And I, I distinctly remember walking down. They, that, that's the worst feeling I've ever felt because I've never cheated racing ever no once and you to, get a label it's hard to shift exactly this and I'm, I'm aware of, of what that what that means that cheating label and as we're walking down with literally i just felt everyone was looking at felt us as if I, yeah felt i was the same so i'm the because you're a team with you're, Chrissy, you're, once you're down uh, like you know i'll back I, I was there to back him through thick and thin whether you know he stands on the top of the podium or we just you know <coughs> on the floor like that yeah so we we both walked down uh to be told you're disqualified lads you've you lost your points and i know you know i was trying to sort of fight chris's corner and saying well can you please like chris said to, you know take the take the engine get it checked by a bmw official and just get it checked it that the bike is legit no no sorry that it's been checked by the chief scrutineer it's all you know it's all done you points have been removed anyway Never forget walking back up the hill at Cadwell Park, me and Chrissy, and we were just devastated. He was obviously devastated. Just I could just see in his face deflated, and I was deflated for him. And walking back up, and I'm not going to name who it was, but um, there was two people stood uh, in the the bottom pit of Cadwell Park and went, "Now then, Brogy, you cheating bastards." That was it. He said to us, to me and Chrissy, "Now then, Brogy, you cheating bastards." And I just, I think I just shouted something back, F off you or whatever, and just carried on walking. I said to Chrissy, right, listen, take no notice, mate. Let's, we'll, I said, leave this with me and I'll get onto it through the week and we'll get, I'm going to get this put straight. So anyway, um, as it happened, I was coaching the technical guy at BMW UK that followed that coming week at Silverstone, I think it was. So, and I'd coached him before, um, and I said to this guy, Steve, I said, Steve, do us a favour, mate. I said, 
we're in this situation, the engine's been checked out, it's been, something's gone amiss somewhere, it hasn't been checked properly or whatever, but we're 110% that this engine is legit. Can you um, come forward and, and uh, explain how this needs to be done? Because Phil Crow, who done Chrissy's engines, was adamant, and it was him that pointed out to me that it wasn't, it, it wasn't checked properly using the correct procedure. So I said, right, okay, so it needs to go. For, so therefore, it then come out of uh, BSB's hands and goes into the hands of MCRCB, which is Motorcycle Racing Control Board. So then, right. like a, like a, sec, a separate panel. Um, so then, that's good to hear. I didn't even yeah, know that so, fact. That's so, so, a proper so, procedure. That's yeah, yeah. So, so it's not like um, you, you know, uh, Stuart, internal uh, affairs Stuart, of motorcycling. Yeah, Stuart, Stuart and his team they do a great job and police and everything. But this was just a legitimate mistake, and and so we wanted to correct it anyway. So they come forward. So uh, the BMW guy Steve Bell has had to come forward and. Um, present the case how the bike was checked and how it should be checked so they take a statement from him statement from us and then obviously from the scrutiny of how it was done can I, where can is I the just, engine in all this time uh, like, no, no, can no, I just no, say just, so that, that sure. same engine we then, we then uh, took it to Phil Crow's I put, it cost a grand to put it back to, to into Either the bike right? yeah. and, but then I was saying to BSB look it's exactly the same engine that I'm putting back in so if we're going to if you're going to check it the same way it's so important that you, you need to learn how to, 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 do to it check properly. it properly because every round we're going to get disqualified because there's no way we it is it's legit the there's same. nothing we can change so we'll put the same <laughs> engine back in and I've never been as fired up for a weekend yeah. we've got there all that that done was just lit your Wet. fire, didn't it? The, uh, it was pissing down in FP1, and I went out, and I was I was over two seconds a lap faster than anyone. Richard Cooper did one lap at the end to to get within two seconds, but nobody. If you look at that timesheet, there's people like Danny Buckham was six and a half seconds a lap slower in the wet. Uh, and just went out, and I've never been as fired up. Anyway, didn't that engine shit blow itself in FP one? So the wet. That's straight. So, the, but then everyone was talking even more. Ah, oh, that was the engine. It shit itself. It must have been, must have been illegal up. anyway. So then we put an old knackered engine in, didn't we? One mm -hmm. that was the horsepower was well down. C can I just say? But then. <clears throat> So the because the judges from MCRCB were were there, they had the chance to check the same engine again. So the the um the, this time they used the tool properly, and it was obviously legit. And but this then, is the one that shagged. Yeah, but then they showed they showed that if you didn't do it properly, like what they tried to do with Cadwell, that it w this tool wouldn't have went on. So the judges were kind of like, well, we've seen enough here, and therefore I got my points reinstated, and uh, and it went out that I'd got, got everything back, which was. Such a Monkey relief because when you yeah. yeah when you tarnish with that brush unfairly there's an injustice there. <clears throat> or even talking about it now, I'm like so, getting angry about so, it. So so up until that point, that weekend at Silverstone, myself, Chrissy, and the whole team were just tarnished as cheating bastards basically across the across the paddock, especially in in Superstock thousand terms where I've been in that class for so many years and I didn't want myself to be tarnished as a cheat. Because I've never agreed with cheating, and you know, and been totally against anyone cheating over the years, and I certainly didn't want to be uh, labelled yeah. a, a cheat. And I, and so, I was I, I was passionate about, and to be fair to Russ, the team manager, he put his money down and yeah, put five hundred pounds we, up for MCRCB protest, to to comment. to protest. Yeah, so then. That weekend, when we got the results of you reinst you um, reinstated, so you, you get your points back and all the rest of it, and like Chrissy said, it was just that weight off your shoulders of we're not a cheat and and you know and but still he had the fire in his belly then uh, that weekend and he just wanted to obliterate everyone and uh, he was so close to getting his first stock thousand win that weekend and literally was leading on the last lap and crashed with two corners to so go. I was what devastated, but sorry, can I just <clears throat> and that night driving home, uh, as gutted as we were that he didn't win the race, we went for an Indian, can yeah, you yeah, yeah, you? yeah. Me and me and Chrissy went for an Indian and had a, had a little bee and, and whatever. And um, I never forget, I, I uh, you ever seen Mr. Bean? Where um in, a, in Mr Bean Rowan Atkins where he goes in his car and he's going down the streets and he's going yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to everybody. I posted that on my Twitter feed. I think to, this is to the people that called us cheats when we were walking back up the hill. I'm not, I'm not going to name them because there's no need to, but it was for them to, to 
basically tarnishing us as cheats straight away. And when we got it reinstated, although we just, Chris didn't win the race that weekend, for me, it felt like we definitely got a, a big win there. But and just it was so you, nice to have that lifted off you our You understand shoulders. the emotions going into that race and imagine crashing with two corners to go. If if I'd won that... to oh, What did you whisper in his ear before he went off down that road? You know, After the qualifying, after everything, rolled to, up, to, it's to pissed rain. Well, like, here to, we go. To be honest, that... Chrissy had uh, he had all the tools in his locker anyway. I no matter what I ever said to him on the grid, it was never going to make the difference to him to his results. He knew what he had to do. All the work has done way before him lining up on the grid. The only things that I might obviously whisper in your ear, you know, on the grid is just be wary of this or be wary of that. Things, possibilities that. You know, just just uh, obvious ones, not to be caught out short in this area or that area on the first lap or two or whatever. Don't throw it away by doing this or doing that, and and you know, just uh, get your head down. But it was a it was a good adventure, mate, wasn't it? And it was I, I was I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with you for two years. I enjoyed the whole roller coaster of the ups and the downs with yourself and with Jordan. Um, I'm coaching another youngster this year in uh, British in Stock 600 Championship, a young lad called James Bull, who, um, from the sounds of it, is in a very similar position to what Jordan was in when I first started working with him. So there's a lot, um, there's there's a lot of improvement to be gained for him, um, and I'm really looking forward to the challenge with him to bring him from where he is. To see how close to the front we can get them, um, and also, so. would you like to? Get, obviously, you run a separate business of you, your track day coaching and stuff. Do you want to give a, a good plug? And yeah, for anyone, exp- um, for anyone out there that that um, does track days. I mean, for me, doing what I do on track day coaching is, it's like uh, it's so black and white. I can see from one twenty minute session following someone, I can see a crash before it's going to happen. So I can tell you one basic thing, do this or do that or change this or change that to stop you having 10 crashes maybe in the future. And my sort of slogan that I use in my uh, sewer bike school business is invest in yourself before you bike. Well, it's a no-brainer. Whatever, If you want to shortcut your way to being a faster, safer rider without making all the mistakes and smashing your bike along the way and smashing you on the way, just pay for a bit of coaching, whether it be me or another top coach. There's there's other good coaches over there, out there, albeit I would say there's only a handful of good coaches um, that actually know what they're talking about. And when I say that, I mean, if you're going to pay somebody good money for coaching on track, make sure it's somebody who's been there and done it, yeah. not... not just experience a, talks yeah, in this not, game. not just an experienced track day rider or no disrespect but or one of your mates who's faster than you trying to tell you what to do pay for somebody to tell you the 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 right way to do it and the reasons behind it to back it up what they're telling you because the chances are that experienced ex racer who you paid to have coaching with they're telling you from experience because they've felt the pain of every high side or every tuck on the front and it can be done it can be done and you don't have to hate yourself you can enjoy your bike and whichever circuit you go on so much more by investing that little bit of coaching exactly the same as what you've done Chrissy with your two years of working with me uh, coaching on a racetrack but Mm. track day in track day terms there's there's massive margins to be had. Uh, sorry, just to, I know I'm waffling on a load here. I coached a couple of uh, club races right at uh, Donington uh, a year or two ago, and they were fast lads. Like they had the top thousand cc <coughs> BMW or ZX tens. There was two of them on the same day. I come on my school, and uh, I was on bog standard ZX ten with snotter x-race tyres of yours i think they were and uh, st- uh standard exhaust but with a can indicators everything still on my bike and these guys were like looking at my bike thinking you ain't gonna fucking stand a chance here with with us today you know because they're they're like full super stock spec and they're like top of um thunder sport gb or mro whatever it was called back then. and um I was thinking, right, okay, so we get started, and it was only, I don't know, whacking it again, there's only um, 
there were only small margins of areas where they improved because obviously the faster you get the smaller the margin Aye, the window gets smaller. so but it was it was that being more precise in certain areas they were both amazed at how much they'd learned from me in one day and their top club races winning club races like a uh, um, thunder sport they couldn't believe and they're like steve how like and again i'm not blowing smoke up my own ass but they were like how are you doing the lap times you're doing with us on a bog standard road bike but for me it's my trade so it's it's expected that mm-hmm. for me it was nothing as long as i've got good grip and decent tires and the heat in the tires i can do it no problem and i've always said the day that i'm not fast enough to to show anybody around will be the day that i hang my leathers up Fair enough. Is it like really quick question? Um, a lot of riders like Lee Johnson, Dean Harrison, Christian Eden, um, a lot of them do track days with like Jamie Whitham. A lot of these top lads are doing that coaching element for more track days rather than race improvement. Now, a couple of people have told me, like even riding a bike on the road, if you were still racing, would you be coaching? Because I've heard like coaching can slow you down, but you, you learn, you probably learn more about your own riding, but you in, no, I'm just going to no, simplify I, I, the question. If you were still racing, <clears> would coaching, coaching, would it slow it down? <clears throat> would it slow you down? Uh, yeah, there's an element to that that I believe if um, if you're track day coaching and you're coaching guys in novice group and you're tiptoeing around Anglesey and Croft a second, third gear and you know really, really steady... Yeah, you kind of get stuck in a rut of going that slow, but then to um, literally flick the switch and go bang, uh, BSB race winning pace, it's like woof. It's a, it's an I like for me, and I can relate to it because I'll go from one one session I'll be coaching a real amateur novice in novice group where it's like second third gear and they're just tickling the throttle all the way around which is fine <clears throat> then you then in, in in the next group i'll be in the fast group and then i'll be coaching uh, a, a top you know fast track day rider or a club racer and then you're like oh bloody, uh, all of a sudden you feel I, i'm telling myself bloody i'll wake up steve wake up like get get in the zone and you've got to get in the zone and find your rhythm and and really up your game mm. from in comparison to what you've just been doing. So, yeah, to answer your question, it's a it's a it's a big difference from when you're coaching, then going back into race mode. It's a, it's a wake up call, and and you you're almost like sort of question yourself, shit, can I still do this? And sometimes when I if I get a fast lad on with me, um, uh, it's it puts a smile on my face when. When I do, when I can still gap them as and when I want, it puts a smile on my face to tell me I've still got still it a little bit, yeah. you know. Well, yeah. When you know you've got that, I'm nowhere near the edge of crashing, but I'm I'm still able to to pull a gap and show them the way to go when I want to or when I need to, you know. No, that, 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 <clears> that is, because I tell you what, the reason I ask, I've got asked to do a little bit of coaching. I've got my ACU coaching license for the tests, yeah. you know, try and help people out in that. And... I got asked to do a bit of coaching, and now I don't have a lot of short term experience, and I've been given an opportunity to ride for DC Race and like New Roads team, and we're going to do Thunder Sport, and I'm thinking, do I do I like do, do I get that extra bit of track time coaching, or will it slow me down to go and try and win races? And no, it's kind the, of, the, 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 um, if you were when just you say extra bit of track time, don't think coaching is, uh, is going to give you track time and it's going to benefit you for your racing. Right. It's it, it. There's n- there's no way it will because you. you're tiptoeing around coaching people. You ain't going to learn nothing. Right. You're not going to learn nothing about what your race bike's going to do when you're coaching anyone. You will learn more in the first five minutes of when you're allowed to go flat out as fast as you can than what you ever are going to do in one or two days coaching somebody in novice or intermediate group yeah so don't don't look at um coaching just like you know when you like talk about saddle time time. Ah, it's just like because like i'm I'm a forest by trade so me getting on a bike's on a circuit i'm thinking if i do i'm not talking about full time you're doing the odd day but no that's a free bit of it hopefully that's free hopefully don't send me an invoice totally different is what i'm saying is uh, yeah it's not a benefit to you don't get me wrong if you if you're going on a on a track day coaching where you're going to get a little session by yourself and you can go out and go flat out and get your head down then you're going to be in a benefit but 
if you're just coaching, it's not. Um, yeah, you're not really gaining anything. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for that, by the way. Got, <laughs> got a quick, a quick uh, messages from our patrons. We've got one from David Young. Remember seeing Steve racing an S. 1000 RR against James May on Top Gear years ago. How did that come about <laughs> and was uh, what was the experience like? Um, I, do you know what? I still get asked this question quite a bit because obviously it's not often bikes go on Top Gear, is it? And mm. it, was a, it was quite a unique thing for me, which I enjoyed doing back in the day. So it was um, BMW UK asked me to do it <clears throat> and it was because my bike was a standard road bike as in a uh, standard engine, although it had, it had the um, the Superbike ECU on, but it was no electronics or anything. And um, uh, we went there to the uh, the the aerodrome proving ground where they, they have the track and all the rest of it. And it was me against the Aerial Atom V8, and obviously we were doing time trials. And then um, we didn't actually do a race, you know, like together, like Aye. a proper race, because it would be quite dangerous if like You'll lead the, the, car, <laughs> the car's trying to duff me up the inside and I cut in the front of him and stuff so but what we did do we done some lapsed filming together where like it was staged where I'd overtake the car into such and such a corner the car had overtake me there so it was all done safely and you know and um, they they made out it was James May driving the car it wasn't it was Tiff Nadell and Tiff was literally sideways in this V8 aerial atom and I'm not kidding, it was the width of this trailer. I had to stay behind the bike, uh, the car. And I just thought to myself, if he spins that car now, I'm straight into the side of him and over the top. <laughs> anyway, to to answer this question, uh, the, the bike was night and day faster than the car. It was like easily like two or three seconds faster than what the car was. Because my team that were there with me were timing the car and timing the bike when... <clears throat> they give us like half an hour to go out for me to learn the track and get me down, do some fast laps, and and then same with the car, and then we done messing about with filming and stuff. And the bike was never gonna win on a car show, was it? They're not gonna. <laughs> a no, car never gonna show. A car that. show's never gonna let mm -hmm. a, you know let all the car enthusiasts, um, you know. <laughs> I heard I heard a thing the thing about but the know, truth's out, kids. You know when exactly. the when the Tesla first were, uh, like. The, they made the first sort of model of the Tesla. The Tesla dropped one off at Top Gear, and when the when they dropped the Tesla off, the uh, the guy the guy from Tesla seen a script, and they had a script of the what was going to happen, and the Tesla was uh, battery was going to run out, and um, it was going to have a, a problem with something else, and they were like, "Hang on, like you could, that's making Can't us look that. like a," tw and they're like, "No, no, <clears> it's just entertainment." Yeah, but people watch Top Gear and they sort of right. buy, up, well, buy cars off. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you've said that, Chrissy, because what happened that day so we turned up with my um evo bike which was a standard engine with the uh, motec ecu slick tires in which is what we use in super bike and the the you know a full super bike chassis so it had proper brembo brakes and all the rest of it so the team pulled my bike out and, and got the tire warmers on tire pressures done all the rest of it and um i didn't understand what was going to happen i just was told i'm racing against one of them um, and then I found out on the day it was James May and James was there smoking cigarettes and all the rest of it, like a scruff like he is. And um, and then they said to, they come to us literally an hour before we were going to start filming and said, um, you can't use that. And and uh, so Bernie, my team manager, said, oh, what do you mean? He said, well, it's got s full slick tyres on, you know, it's not road going. It needs to be a road bike, so it needs road tyres on. So I said to I said to Bernie, I'm not riding that. I'm not riding that round this track on, on proper road tires. I said, Have we got any um stock tires, um super stock tires with us? And Richard Cooper's my teammate at the time, we had some of his super stock tires in the van, so he said, I said, put them on, that'll do. Um and then so I had to ride a road bike, full road bike. So they wouldn't let me ride the race bike, which they it was supposed to be designed about. Yeah. I had to ride a stock road bike with indicators, but I said I'm not riding it on the road tires that I had on it on this road bike what BMW had brought. So I said, just put the super stock race compound tires on, I'll be fine with that. <clears throat> so that's what we've done. But Bernie, my team um manager was spitting feathers because he had the bike sold the week before the the filming 
and he kept hold of the bike or put it all back to race trim or whatever, ready for for the filming. And then he, he said, right, an hour before filming, we don't need the bike. Ride that road bike there instead. So, but but then when you looked at the Ariel Atom, it had like full Olin's suspension, full Bren- Brembo calipers like that big. Um, it was like the the trickest race car with a reg plate on for the roads, V eight, and I was like, <laughs> time to pull the pin. Yeah. <laughs> one one more question from Mike Orton. It's a long one, so I'm not sure how much we'll get through it. Is Steve's also a Superstock Thousand champion? In what way are the bikes different now from when he was riding? What are the technological improvements which he would keep? And conversely, are there any which he thinks the series would be better without? E.g., traction. He does quite a lot, bit of track and training. Has he ever had anyone on any of these days who he's thought, yes, they are a bit extra special, and will go on to be very successful? We'll go for the the uh, Superstock things. Is, is Sorry, who, who was that? Who was Mike that for? Orton. Mike. Mike Orton. Orton. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I thought it was somebody else who I thought I might know uh, from one of the tracks. Um, yeah, okay. So to answer that question, so the the bike, uh, super stock bikes back when I was racing, like the Blade had zero electronics on, no traction Full control. Full whiskey. Off you go. Yeah, so it was all down to that. And um, I mean, if I over revved my bike on the downshift into the corners and the back wheel locked up, I'd have to feather it on the, on the two fingers Physically on the clutch. Physically slip the clutch. <clears throat> so, to stop it locking up, it, you go into, like, hairpins, like, uh, Druids at Brands, and... I've seen a picture play, of you backing it in. Yeah, on places the like Lodge at Open Park, where you go in and you're, like, screeching to get the bike stopped, and on the back wheel, you've kicked the gear out, say, back to second gear, but way further back where you should have, because you're trying to get the bike stopped, and you're just controlling it, on your two fingers and the bike sideways, and that's how we used to. I never ever touched the rear brake in my life, but whenever any pictures of me backing it in is all done on the clutch, <clears throat> um, just to disengage the back wheel ever so slightly when it was backing in. But obviously, now with the bikes, with the electronics, with the auto blippers, uh, back shifting the gears, you don't even use the bloody clutch, do you? Going down the gears on, on your bikes now, they're so easy to ride in technically uh, you know fast faster and safer for you guys because there was times when i didn't cu- didn't always get it right you know i'll be back in the <laughs> for, for example i remember one time at uh, uh, croft in 08 I, I went in backed it in sideways and i went back one gear too many and and i was holding on the clutch and it didn't frame bang ping me right over the top but uh, with your bikes now, with the um, the the auto blipper on, when you go down the gears, for those that don't know, you just close the throttle, hit the brakes, and don't touch the clutch at all. You just on the gear stick, just go bam bam, knock the gear stick down. The bike automatically blips and does the nice smooth downshift, like automatic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. For for you now, and obviously it's lovely for me coaching on my brand new ZX10 now off Kawasaki, and. I go out, leave the pit lane. I don't even touch the clutch till I get back because it's a lot less effort. Um, Are you a road or race shift? <clears throat> I was always um, race shift when I raced. Aye, just ready a coaching. <clears throat> but I can use uh, I can use either because obviously whenever I used to go out on a dirt bike or no. you, you're straight back to road change, aren't you? But um, the electronics, uh, which is all the technology passed down to stock from Superbike and MotoGP, is. Is obviously all the improvements that they've been developed, you know, at that level filtered down, and it's brilliant for you guys because ultimately it makes you faster and safer. Without, you know, <clears throat> there's one thing having a having rider coach showing you all the bits and bobs of of you know how to go fast in terms of you as a rider, but then on your bike when you've got all these electronics you can have too much of like traction control or too much anti wheelie or have your ABS turned on and all these things that that could hold you back as you probably you've played about with it a lot I know haven't you mm-hmm. um so yeah but for me uh 2013 there was a bit of traction control on but I used to hate it because I, I wasn't used to it yeah <clears throat> and the traction control then wasn't quite as good as what it is now, so I just used to leave it off. That's, uh, that's the same as like Ant- Andy Wheelie's been on bikes for years, but up until pretty much this last year, I've always had mine totally turned off because it was it wasn't good enough to aid 
hated the rider. So it would yeah. it, maybe for somebody like that was riding on the road that just didn't want the bike to wheelie, great. But for racing, it was a disadvantage where it's only now it's becoming that good. Same with the traction that you can actually because like even in 2017 when it, a, a lot of the time I would t- totally turn all my traction off and my anti wheelie and would just be riding it like that. Where I th- it, the latest sort of uh, generations of the bikes, the the, the are game getting, stepped up, hasn't yeah, they it? Are, yeah, they are getting good. The game changer for me in terms of electronics now is that is the auto blipper. Like that, boom, 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 boom. That, and it doesn't matter how hard um, you hit the paddle, yeah. is it? Boom, so boom, boom. you can back shift the gear too many; it will not lock that back wheel up. It feels it's... weird going on a, on another <coughs> bike and using the clutch now because yeah. you're so used to just not yeah. using it. Aren't you? Well, it's so really? alien. If when, when you get on an older bike now and you've got a downshift or <coughs> downshift using the clutch, it's it's, a, it's such an effort, isn't it? Whereas um, on the all the latest bikes now these auto blippers are fantastic mm-hmm. well, I'm, I'm very I ride several bikes in the season you get on a classic bike and you think get the, you watch a lot of lads hop back on the classic bikes and the people have got their umbrella out to catch the valves that are going to hit them off the head you've just got to do, <laughs> you've just got to think about what you're doing it's mad well um I think that's uh, have you got any other questions um, I was just about to say is there any are you, um well, I know you're not going around banging on people's door, but is there space for people for to get in touch with you and work with this yeah, season? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, for anybody wanting any track day coaching, um, if you want to check my website out, which is www.stevebrogansewerbikeschool.co.uk forward slash TSB. <laughs> <laughs> um, my contact number's on there, my email. Um, give us a shout. There's... The dates are limited, uh, which I've have had to pre-book this year because obviously because of COVID and um, the track days have been selling out so fast. I've had to book spaces on the track days for myself and my clients. Yes. So if you book via my website or you, you give me a call if you have any questions, the price on my uh, website, which is 7 9 5 for the day, that includes your track day fee as well. So there's no extra on top of that. And, yeah, I know it's a lot of money. It's 800 quid. But it, it costs me a lot of money to be there and, and obviously oh, have yeah. my bike. And I've got to pay a track day fee to get on there as well to coach you. So, um, but the, the way I've uh, basically made it 200 quid cheaper this year for people rather than last year is... I'll coach two one-to-one people on the same day. So I'll generally have one one-to-one rider in the novice group and one in the intermediate group. So, And what I'll say to any fast fast group riders, if you want coaching, <clears throat> just book, my, book one of the spaces in the intermediate group because even though you're a fast group rider, it doesn't mean that I can still coach you the same level in the intermediate group. It's just... I personally choose to coach, not coach in the fast group because there's so many hooligans out there in the fast group that I've, it's so dangerous. I've been clipped many a times and it's, uh, it's me putting you in a safer position yes. to coach yeah. you and it's easier for you to take everything in that I've got to show you and tell you at a, a little 10%, 20% backed off. And then, you, then we can introduce the speed. But we can still go fast. That's no, not a problem. But yeah, but check my website out or give us a call, guys. If uh, Opportunities if in the BSB <clears throat> paddock. You know, if there's any... Like, right, we get a lot of competitors listening to this. You know, if they want to work with you, is it the same way? Just get in touch. Um, I'll never have your own number, man. To be like, guys, yeah, to be honest, Tom, it's not, it's not really... It's not something that I'm uh, sort of out there advertising... Um, I'm already yeah. right now. I'm already committed to to one young rider at yes. every BSB this year, and and sort of I'm committed yeah. to him, young James Bull, for the rest of the season. Okay, and, yeah. and so that's me. That'll save it. people pestering you. That <clears> yeah, no, <laughs> but thanks anyway. It's so I'm committed to him for the rest of the season um, at all the BSB races. Cool. Um, but definitely, if if anybody needs any help for next year or or beyond, give us a shout. And yeah, there uh, we go. You're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or Steve Brogan. Yeah, or well, uh, Steve Brogan seventeen on most of my social medias, Twitter and um, Instagram. Fantastic. Happy well, thanks, days. thanks so much for your time uh, here today. With uh, and you know, nice to see all the family and everything. It's always good to see Tiggs and the kids. Cheers, guys, and best of luck to you, mate, this year. I'll be rooting for you, as always, from home or at the track, hopefully, if I'm going to be there working. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and to you, Dom, as well, with whatever you venture to do this year. Thank you very much. You as well. well. It's always good. a pleasure <laughs> listening to you both. Oh, thank you. Well, big thanks, as always, to our patrons and to our sponsor, Colchester Kawasaki, and we'll catch up with you next week. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers, Steve. See you in a bit. <laughs> 
Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing.